should be about 200 to 250. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, while we give folks just a couple of minutes to log in, please feel free to introduce yourself, your country, and your organization in the chat so we can see where everyone is calling in from. We'll get started here in just a couple of minutes. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We will get started here in just one or two minutes. While we wait, please feel free to introduce yourself, your organization, and your country in the chat so we can see where everyone is calling in from today. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, please continue to introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, we'll get started here with some introduction slides before I pass it over to our presenter. Again, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining. Continue to introduce yourself, your organization, and your country in the chat. Um, throughout today's webinar, you're free to ask any question you'd like, um, and I will be monitoring the questions and Doug, of course, will be answering them um, throughout the presentation today. So um, please feel free at any time to ask your questions in the Q&A box and we will get to those questions at those designated points. Doug will also occasionally ask uh, folks to raise their hand um, as a response to several questions. So uh, please interact in that way as well. We'd love to hear um, your thoughts and your participation. The presentation slides, as well as a recording of today's webinar, will be available on ASAP2's website at www.intrahealth.org slash ASAP resources, um, and that will be available uh, by the end of the day today, East Coast, Eastern Standard Time, um, and definitely in the morning for those of you who perhaps are finished working by then. Again, USAID and ASAP have broadcast over 110 webinars for more than 22,000 attendees in 76 different countries. So thank you for adding to those numbers today. Um, again, our webinars are available um, in three different languages. Um, so French, English, and Portuguese. So whichever uh, language is your preferred language. Um, and again, that's at the interhealth.org slash ASAP resources website. And I will send that link in the chat shortly. We have a couple of upcoming webinars. One is next week. Um, our presenter today, Doug Frankie, is will be presenting a uh, another presentation on USAID financial policies, internal controls, um, and compliance. So if you have any interest in that, please feel free to register and join us next week for that webinar. We also have an additional French language webinar um, on March 12th on leadership and governance, um, a manual that the ASAP team has developed. Um, so if you speak French and would like to hear about that, um, please register for that as well. As I've mentioned, um, today we have Doug Frankie joining us to present um, on procurement. Um, and Doug has done many webinars with us and is an excellent presenter. So please ask all the questions that you have um, in the Q&A box so that he can get to those. Doug was a partner at PwC before founding SSPC, he has 42 years of on the ground experience with USAID slash USG rules. He's a yellow book audit expert. Um, he has clients worldwide and NGOs and LIPs worldwide. Um, he is the only peer reviewed audit firm in Africa. So please um, welcome Doug um, and 
Doug, I'll go ahead and uh, take it away for our presentation today. Thank you very much, Melissa, and welcome all. Uh, I'm delighted to be here again. I see many familiar names uh, and countries. I see we go over to Thailand, Vietnam, some of the stands, and so it's quite exciting. And then over to Nigeria on the west side, which is uh, a nice broad cross section. Uh, today is going to be, let's see, we're going to share, I'll share my slides. Thank you, Melissa. Let's go here and we'll pull these up. And yeah, so it's about, but we're going to talk about a lot of things today. And um, it is, the reason why is because there's going to be a significant rule change coming up, rules changes, dozens and dozens and dozens. So I just want to, at the very beginning, go over what these are likely to be and how that's going to affect you. And you have to think, these will probably come into effect as early as, in theory, March, but probably April, May. And what we're waiting to see is uh, these changes, are they going to become immediate or are they going to be during the next year, the next U.S. government year? Okay, so, but regard, regardless of what you're doing, if it's immediate, you have to be aware because all these are pretty much better opportunities for you to either receive, uh, not necessarily more funding, but uh, way fewer strings with the U.S. aid funding. So it'll be quite exciting. And I'll go into that as well. Okay, certainly you've already seen. Uh, yeah, we're quite excited about doing this. I have spent quite a while um, learning the rules starting in 1982 uh, with USA Cairo uh, in Egypt and pretty much have done this ever since. So that's what we do. We are here for you, either implementing partners, uh, audit firms, of course, we train them as well as the uh, USA admissions. Okay, so let's get into it. So procurement is one of the things yeah, and many of you have attended either other courses here or the online courses we do or in-country courses uh, and for a number of missions. But procurement is one of those areas that you need someone, I call it a specialist, but someone who has more knowledge than just attending this course or even a longer course. Okay, but there's procurement, there's timekeeping, there's fixed asset management, there's uh, HR, uh, there is certain finance pieces that are, and of course, indirect costs. We did the indirect cost course uh, a month or two back, and I think we had 500 and something people, but that's in a huge area of needing understanding. Okay, so procurement is one of these. So even in the hour and a half or two hours we're going to have, uh, I'm going to expose you to the rules, but I can't necessarily say after two, after two hours you're going you're gonna to be an expert. Okay, so let's just let, let's, let's get through it. Uh, we're always here for questions uh, after the fact for you as well. Okay, one more thing, and, and especially, you know, even though, as Melissa says, this, this, you know, this webinar will be available after the fact, it is going to become dated once those new, uh, once the new rules are promulgated. And I'll talk about that now. So once that happens, you know, all bets are off. And you can't say, oh, Doug said this on the 28th of February because, you know, next month, uh, these rules may not be necessarily relevant. Okay, so where did the rules come from? And let's just, let, let me do, let's do one thing now. Let's just, could you please raise your hand? I just want to see, I, I'm going to ask sometimes, and I'm going to try to get some percentages of, okay, we've got, a, what, 120 participants. Uh, so if you could just please raise your hand. And so I can see, uh, let's just go here, let's see what we got. Yeah, let's just... Let's just see here. I think just again, everyone, please try to find the button and raise your hand because sometimes they're going to say, okay, how many of you have this or this? And, you know, if I don't get full participation, then my percentages are off. Okay. So we're getting, okay. All right. That's a good number. Thank you. Okay. So let's go to the starting point for this all is the Code of Federal Regulations. Okay, USAID, Agency for International Development, is just one of about 28 agencies. And it's interesting when you look up agency, it's not, not so well defined. Some of the things happening at the border and other things aren't necessarily agencies. But let's just assume there's 28 agencies. Okay, USAID is just one of many. And they all have to follow this, what's called the Uniform Guidance or these Code of Federal Regulations, which can be found at two, sorry, at, at uh, uh, www.ecfr, standing for Electronic Code of Federal Regulations.gov. Okay, and in many of the other webinars we've done, we've walked you through it, but basically just go there, www, 
www.ecfr.gov and get you'll here's a splash page and then you know you'll make some various clicks to get down to two CFR which is pretty much the US aid version okay many of you let's do this like give me a quick uh, hands up if you also receive funding from Health and Human Services CDC NIH please put your hand up if you get PEPFAR or any funding from other government agencies right well, know especially just Health and Human Services say CDC you might be a PEPFAR, which is the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. Okay, keep your hand up for a second while these go. Okay, so a good number of you do. I'm not going to talk too much about CDC, Health and Human Services, but uh, there are some, some unique differences that we'll be talking about. Okay, so theirs is, all, although I say ours, USAID, and most agencies are at the 2 CFR 200, Health and Human Services, stroke CDC, they placed their equivalent at 45 CFR 75. Okay, so you 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 effectively when you get to that point in the code, you'd bookmark that saying, "Here's my US aid version," or "Here is my CDC version," is what we like to call it. Okay, so that's where the rules come from. Now each agency has the opportunity to modify these rules, and we'll be talking about that now. US aid is very unique in that they work you know, foreign overseas. So it's, uh, you know, logically uh, there is going to be that uh, that difference. Okay, so here's just some of the changes I, I thought I'd throw in because this will certainly, this will affect everyone, make no mistake. These are huge, huge, huge changes. Okay, so the first change that there's, now these are proposed and promulgated. I've got the, uh, I, I, I can send to anyone if you want. There is the what we call the red line version of these documents. And I think it's 500 something pages. We have got a whole folder here of it. Uh, and there's a, and I'm only showing you about 23 or four, I think of the significant ones, but there are many more. And so these were sort of promulgated and it started last year. Every five years, the UG has to be updated. Uh, it was started probably about a year ago, actually. And then in October, they put out a note that anyone wanted to comment on it, you had until December 4th or 5th. Uh, we certainly commented. And then they're in the review stage. But once it gets into the draft stage and, and they ask for comments, pretty much it's done. Okay, so what we're talking about here is pretty much likely going to happen, maybe with some minor changes, but assume all these will probably be in effect. Okay, so the first thing is the current audit threshold is $750,000. If you spend more than seven fifty dollars in your fiscal year, not the U.S. government's fiscal year, you will have what we call the yellow book audit. Okay, so that's a big thing. If, 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 the interesting thing, why were these changes made? They were made to make it easy, easier for the people administering U.S. government funds in the United States. You know, over 99.5% over of the total funds spent, the four point X trillion dollars, is spent in the states, state and local governments, NGOs in the U.S., American Indian indigenous people and uh, colleges, universities. That's who gets all these billions and trillions of dollars. So we're just a tiny, we're less than one half of, well, we're, we're tiny, less than one half of 1%. Okay, so all these changes were made to make life in the states easier for the administrators. Now for us overseas, what this means is it's easier for maybe USA to give us the funds, but it's more risk. Okay, all this to me screams risk. So make sure you have your risk management person, whoever she or he is, aware that these changes are coming and when they hit, you better study them. Okay, so this audit threshold goes up, which means if you're a prime with a sub, please put your hand up if you're a prime recipient with sub recipients. I'd like to know how many of you have primes with subs. Okay, all right, already, uh, well, that's quite a huge percentage already. Okay, so that's a huge risk for you. Okay, because if, if we're auditing you, we're let's say you're a prime, we're auditing you as a prime auditor. Uh, these guys, your subs who are now under a million. Okay, well, you know, they're not audited, but we prime, we're, if we're auditing you as a prime, our job as an auditor is to make sure that you've done your job. Okay, so it's again, you're opening up huge risk. Now, there's just more people under you who aren't going to be audited just means more risk for you. Okay. So what we have, the next two clarify what agencies uh, require prior approval. Yeah, this is gonna be very interesting to see. 407, we'll talk more about later. That's the cost principle for prior approvals. But the whole point is, you know, there's, there's there used to be 26 specific things that needed prior approval, vehicles and, and uh, entertainment and, 
and lobbying certain types of things. Now, 10 of those are missing. Okay, and what this seems to say to me is that if you, IPs, put this in your budget, and there's two parts of a budget. There's the budget narrative, very important, but then, of course, the spreadsheet. Okay, but the, the theory is if you put it in your budget, then uh, it's not necessarily going to need further prior proof. So this is a huge, huge gray area already, and it'll get even more gray. The bottom line for all of this, IPs, is to make sure you know what your agreement officer thinks about what needs prior approval, uh, especially, you know, when I say prior approval, obviously, once you get your award, you're going to operate. But then after that, there's a certain number of things that need prior approval after the fact, after you've won the award. Uh, you want to make sure you know what your AO thinks. Okay, now this could three, continue to provide U.S. aid with discretion of to applying parts A through E. Now, there's actually another part. Part F is the audit part. Okay, and so there's just no doubt. A lot of people are confused. You got to be very careful here. A lot of people think the audits that are done in the states, which used to be called A133 audits or subpart F audits, are done overseas, and they're not. Okay, what we do overseas is what's called a yellow book audit. Okay, comes in a yellow book. Comes in, and that's it's basically it's available at GAO.gov. It just got updated two weeks ago. But the bottom line is this is what we do overseas: a yellow book. Audit. OK, so you got to make sure if you're a sub of a U.S. prime, you know that they know what you're going to give them. OK, but the other part is this discretion here is what we're talking about. What we'll talk about today is that USAID, because they're so different from the other U.S. based agencies, they were able to create what we're, what we're talking about today, the compliance requirements, which is the what is it? The, um, the ADS 303 or basically stand, known as the. A mandatory standard provisions. Okay, this is the document we'll be going through, or you know the the the, the relevant points of it. Ninety pages. It's definitely worth a read if you're a, a compliance person. Okay, so there will be flexibility. And aid is going through this right now in Washington. There's a team that is. Uh, I know we've had. I'm based here in South Africa for 32 years, but uh, and, you know our, our USA mission is just up the street. Uh, but the whole point is uh, some of the people from here uh, are there, I think, assisting them with modifying this, because once the uniform gu guidance changes, this has to change. That's why I'm saying all bets are off when, when understanding uh, you know, how much to rely on all these rules. OK, what else do we have? Change uh, the modified total direct call MTDC. That's the base upon which you all apply your 10 percent de minimis. OK, please put your hand up if your organization, if you know, if you know, does your organization have the 10 percent de minimis or what we call the indirect cost allowance? OK, please put your hand up if you know your organization does receive the 10 percent de minimis. OK, so this is going to be interesting because basically what you're going to see it's going to go up to uh, MTDC is probably going to go to. Well, no, what, what changes here is from 25 to 50. OK, so the, all those you had sub recipients, you, you used to get 10% uh, on only the first $25,000 uh, and now it's going to be on 50. OK, we're going to see later on the de minimis may increase to 15. So you're going to go from a recovery of probably 2,500 up to 7,500. OK, so that's quite a, quite significant. So there's, again, more more revenue, more uh, more. Well, let's just say more possible recovery for you. OK, this is five. Clarify subs uh, and primes must disclose credible evidence of any sort of uh, any sort of penalties or, or law uh, law issues. This is huge because what is credible evidence? That's a gray area. And it's always been a gray area. You know, the question is, when we think we had some kind of a fraud, when do we report it? It is a requirement under standard revision M26. But when, you know, when we just say, look, we just credible, you know, when someone comes to you and says, I think X stole or we're missing X. OK, that's not credible yet. The minute you do some serious research or go and you look and you double check and someone says, yes, we have a problem. You know, Houston, we have a problem. That's when you report. Okay, Who do we report it to? At the prime level, you report your fraud to your agreement officer and the IG in Washington, the inspector general in Washington. At the sub level, sub recipients, you don't report it to USA, you report it to Prime, whoever gave you the money, and the IG in Washington. Okay, that's quite important. Okay, unexpired funds under fixed amount awards. Does anyone on this call have a fixed amount award or sub award called an FAA? 
fixed amount award or sub award, fixed amount sub award. It's like a baby version of a sub agreement. Okay, at least 10 of, okay, 10 of you. Okay, so generally a fixed amount sub award or award, it's designed to be based on milestones. And the whole point here is that uh, uh, it's designed, you're not gonna make money on it, but you're certainly not supposed to lose money. But the whole point is if you are able to deliver those milestones more efficiently and effectively, then you get to keep the difference. Okay, it's not designed that way, but you know they're not trying to claw back money from fixed amount awards or sub awards. Okay, you can put any questions in the uh, in the Q and A. Okay, simplified acquisition threshold SAT used to be two hundred and fifty. Okay, well, all, all they're saying is okay, that, that's not necessarily going to change, but for fixed amount sub awards overseas, that threshold was two hundred and fifty. That's going away. So those of you who have subs currently are thinking you should think about, geez, couldn't I rather use a fixed amount sub award? It's easier. They're not audited. The cost principles don't apply to them. Uh, there's many, many reasons why you'd want a fixed amount sub award. Okay, so think about that. Okay, so it's going to be easier. You know, it used to be 250, so maybe you had to do two or three of them. Well, now, you know, you don't have to chop and change just to get uh, everything under a fixed amount award or sub award. Okay. This one, the next one doesn't really apply too much to us because USAID always gave us that fourth version of why you don't necessarily need an interest bearing account overseas. Uh, and Islamic banking is what's changed here. So we've always sort of had that under the USAID guidelines, not big for us. Okay, program income for closeout costs. Closeout, one of the most confusing areas. Uh, what did I just, I was up in USAID Harare last two weeks ago. And we did an in-house course for them and their IPs and the auditors. And uh, I was lucky to have a, uh, Office of Financial Management uh, person join us and she went through closeout. And I think we all agree, you know, that, that it's an area wrought with with uh, uh, with the confusion. OK, so again, uh, I mean, we have a whole course on closeout, but the whole point is closeout. You need to know, again, IPs, how does your agreement officer and your OFM people in your country, uh, how do they view closeout costs? Okay, you don't need approval of certain subrecipients, only when making sub awards. So this 10 is uh, in the standard provisions here. It's M3, and it talks about, for USAID, it talks about what needs prior approval. And so here, I think what they're saying is certain types of recipients or subrecipients uh, do not necessarily need prior approval. I don't think much has changed here from a USAID point of view. Okay, I think, you know, to be honest, uh, I, I'm sure aid is going to be, you know, when you propose, uh, and the mission looks at it, the evaluation committee, I think they're looking at your sub awards and certainly when they're doing programmatic things, not your auditor, not your IT company, but your people doing, uh, you know, whatever the program's about, whether it's health or education or economic development, uh, uh, those would be approved at that point. The big question is what happens after that? Okay, these, now we're just starting to talk about eliminating certain types of prior approvals. A lot of these are very important, direct cost property, Entertainment, memberships, participant support costs, always confusing. Okay? Taxes, certain things don't no longer need prior approval. So to me, I scream, it screams risk. Risk. Okay. Because your auditors are going to be looking. And plus, you just be very careful when you're hiring your auditors over the next two years, especially next year. Because if they don't learn these changes, then it's just going to be a continual headache. So make sure your audit firm, uh, you know, make sure you you've somehow determine that they've actually got some, uh, uh, been up to date on the rules and regulations. Okay, now here is a, uh, here is, is so what the, the uniform guidance was put out with the concept that, that all agencies are eventually going to migrate and, and move towards uniformity. Well, they didn't, okay? And it's really starting to upset the OMB that we're I think, in, in our 15th year later now, and they have it. We actually started in 20, when it started 2014 effectively. So that's what 2014, 20. Okay, so we're 10 years. We're in our third change, but 10 years. Okay, so now they're they're putting their foot down. And what this says is if if prime or sub, right? If an agency is not playing by these rules regarding NICRAs, then you can you don't you don't complain to the agency who's dissing you, you complain straight to the OMB. Okay, so there's a number of very prominent uh NGOs across at least Africa who are USAID has given them a night. You've got right to care. You've got mothers to mothers. You have broad reach. You have AMREF. Okay, they all have USAID issued night negotiated rates. CDC doesn't recognize them, which makes their life happen. 
because they have to bifurcate their 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 operations and have like a baby Nigra for CDC. So it's a mess. Now they do the, the, the OMB just said, look, don't complain to CDC, complain to us. So you know, the, the fury will come down from on high. So I think we'll start to see that change. Okay. Now here, primes with subs clarify that primes must accept NICRAs for your subs. So those organizations that I said, the Right to Cares, Brothers, uh, Mothers to Mothers, Broadreach, AMREF, if they're a sub to you and they've got their negotiated rate, you have to accept it. You can't try to haggle and beat them down for it. Okay, this is probably the most important one for all of us. It appears right now that they are intending to raise the de minimis to from 10 to 15. But then there's a sentence that goes on to say up to 15%. Okay, well, that then opens it to interpretation. And that means if it if that sticks, if that concept of up to 15%, then you're all going to need to learn a little bit more about indirect costs. Because effectively, it means you're going to have to justify why you need 15. And let me be honest, everyone, if I, I mean, and we've helped a number of organizations figure out, uh, in South Africa here, they are able to get NICRAs because we've got very good agreement officers uh, in Pretoria who are willing to issue NICRAs. So some organizations say, Doug, should we get one? And say, well, no, 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 let's let, you know, do the back of the envelope and think, you know, what would it be if you had is it 10, 12, 13, 15%? Okay. If you, it, 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 but very few people, uh, would, people, organizations wouldn't have, uh, would have a NICRA greater than 15. Okay. So to be honest, if it goes to 15, this de minimis and, and it's not conditional, uh, then I would certainly, I would, I would be sticking with this 15% de minimis. Okay. But this one is going to be subject to, interest that uh, that it says up to 15%. Okay, if that happens, then you're all going to become sort of mini experts on indirect costs. We did that one a week or no, actually over a month ago. Okay, we've got another course coming up. That's not the ASAP course, but of course, when is it? March 7th starting, and we cover that in, in, in much greater detail. Okay, but let's not worry about that. That is going to be the huge one though. Remember 15%, and then if you've got subs, you've got the higher MTDC base, I think you're in the pound seats. Okay, now this is huge. Do any of you sign, although those of you who are prime recipients, who do any of you sign off to on, on, on your voucher to USAID with the subs cost in it? Okay, so I'm a finance manager of a prime and I'm sending the invoice to USAID uh, for us, of course, the prime and our subs. Okay, well, you are at huge risk because now you have to certify that what you're passing through from the sign, uh, the sub is complete and accurate. Huge risk, right? How do you know what the sub has given you is good? Okay, you're taking the risk. So make sure you have directors and officers insurance uh, for your NGO or for you, okay? But but for everyone, okay, realize that this is again, huge risk. Certification normally, part of this has to do with what's called the False Claims Act in America. And, you know, if there's a, so if, some, if the sub gives you an invoice and says, these are all good costs, you said, all right, well, what if they're not? Okay, you've just submitted a false claim when you pass that on. That puts you personally at risk. So you just got to be very careful there. That you, so if you're, well, either prime, doesn't matter. I mean, you're, you're of course, billing aid for your own expenses. But, um, uh, you know, you're taking huge risks on with your subs. So make sure your subs have strong internal controls. Okay, exchange rates, it doesn't really matter for us. I mean, you know, we, we, some of you actually, well, you probably do receive dollars. Normally the mission will either convert them for you or tell you, you know, give you the exchange rate that you're supposed to use for the calculation. But the bottom line is, uh, you know, you can't manage foreign exchange, it's gonna happen. So you're either gonna have a gain or a loss. So let's not worry about this one right now. Okay, prior approval, some more things that'll be removed and I'll be looking at these a little bit later on. Let's not worry about that. Closeout costs upon termination. This is pretty, as I talked about closeout earlier. That is quite, quite, quite essential that we understand. The concept is six months before your project finishes. So say you're going to finish on June 30 of this year, June 30, 2024. By basically January 1st, you need a plan, a costed out plan that says, great, here's when we're going to stop, you know, start terminating our activities. Maybe you've got field offices, subrecipients you know, almost like a backwards Gantt chart where you're going to start counting down the months and, you know, down to uh, June 30. 
Uh, and then in there, you want to make sure the big takeaway from our Harare training was you got to make sure that you IPs have agreed with your office of financial management at USA and your agreement officer, what costs you're going to include up to June 30 in our example, and what costs you're going to include in that 120 day period after the closeout. Okay. That's key, key, key. We've had too many clients that we've worked with that we've helped either audited or, or assisted that USA didn't allow the costs that were allowable. You know, in the 120 day closeout period because they didn't get prior approval or they didn't they didn't clarify with USA and how they'd be charging it. So huge area of risk. That's OK. The next one talks about that. You can allow to charge administrative costs with closeout. But, you know, I would get that's a prior approval I would absolutely get. OK, don't worry about compliance testing and then direct cost method. Yeah, it just talks about your indirect cost allocation methodology. Okay, so those are interesting. I don't know if we have any Q&A yet. Uh, Melissa, do we have any questions? We could possibly handle those now. We, have any. we don't currently, but um, please feel free to ask uh, them if you have any participants. Um, okay, well, that we was just a brief going overview going. of some things that could be coming. So now you're aware. Great. Okay, so this slide, uh, very busy. And we um, basically what I tried to show you is that the the green boxes are the uniform guidance sections that generally these are the ones that pretty much apply to most of us on this call. Uh, Subpart C was what happens when USA and CDC before they give you the money, what they have to do. And so they are looking at how strong you are at certain types of things. And procurement is certainly one of those. They will have asked you for your procurement policy. So we're talking today about procurement. So make sure your policies are up to date and accurate and that you actually do what your policies say. So sometimes NGOs, and especially we're under this new localization, which is great. New, more local NGOs are going to get funding, fantastic. But of course they come without very sophisticated policies and procedures. Maybe they've grown up from a whatever size, doesn't matter. And so they'll say to a large NGO, they'll say, oh guys, can you know, can, can, you know, you, you've got great policies, can we borrow yours? And then, you know, the nice uh, big prime says, yes, you can borrow ours, but you need to change them to tailor it for yourself. But sometimes people don't. Okay, well, that's the problem. When we, go, when we auditors get in there, right, we audit you based on your policies. And then so we say, well, you're not doing this. You're not getting X quotes, or you're not, you know, you didn't set the threshold this high, or you didn't require, you know, two sign-offs. You say, oh, well, you know, we know we borrowed these from, you know, the, the large NGO. Well, you know, that's the problem. If you borrow, is it if you, I mean, you know, there's a phrase, never a borrower or lender be. Well, that, that comes into effect here, right? If you're going to borrow or loan uh, policies, make sure they are implemented. Okay. Auditors, uh, if, when auditors have issues, right, it means you either broke your rule or you broke USAID's rule. Okay. And it doesn't matter. There's no more severe. Oh, it's okay. USAID didn't require this. If your policies require something, you have to do it. Okay, so I'm just saying, you know, procurement stuff that USA will be looking at in subpart C. Subpart D, this is what today's talk is about. Post-federal award requirements, and that comes from the standard provisions that, that pretty much, that I'm gonna, on the next slide, I'm gonna talk about the light version. Let me just go there now. Okay, so you'll see, sorry, on this slide, you'll see all these red and blue items. Those are the USA CDC rules that used to apply. Okay, well, all these on this slide, all the red X's are what no longer exists and is now the Uniform Guidance 2 CFR 200. Okay, now, as I said earlier, in one of those earlier slides of what's changing, I said agencies still have the authority to modify sections A through E. And that's exactly what they did for, CD, for USAID, and they're going to do again. They create, what they do is this subpart D. Okay, the smart people in Washington, what they do, Dorothea and I think Francisco and his, their, their team, they go through the uniform guides and they say, what are we going to apply to our guys overseas? Foreign guys, you, right? These guidelines are standard provisions for non-US, non-governmental organizations. Okay, that's what I call the light version. So they go through it and basically now they're going to strip out of all these D, E, and F items and they're going to create the, the light version, the non-US standard provisions. That's what today's discussion is about. Okay, so read this. Read your award and read these provisions as part of the attachment. I'll talk about that. But I notice what box is in the middle here. This box represents your cooperative agreement. 
And that's so important, critical, that you read the cooperative agreement, because in that, the agreement officer and her or his team, uh, the OFM and the technical people at your mission, have created your award. They've crafted it. It's a piece of art. It's a piece of work. It's not just cut and paste, right? Certain parts are, but the bulk of it is really tailored to your proposal and tailored to what you're going to achieve. Okay, so read your award. And that's going to have all the essentials that you're going to need to comply with. Okay, we've already talked about the cost principles in previous versions, certainly audit requirements. Uh, you know, there's again, we have auditor courses coming up, but I don't think there's auditors on this course. Okay, so the bottom line is this is what we're going to talk about, non-U.S. standard provisions. There is a U.S. version, but it's not what we call the light version. This non-U.S. standard provisions I call the light version. You've got light Coke, you've got you know Miller Light beer, Bud Light, you've got many lights, light bread. Okay, that's what this is. It's a stripped down version of the uniform guidance. To be honest, if I were all of you, I would read, I would have my team read this subpart D in, 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 in total. Okay, because if you comply with the total version, you will essentially comply with the, with the lighter version. Okay, so here's what your cooperative agreement looks like. And so what we're talking about is attachment C right now. This is where the procurement standard provisions are. I want to talk a little bit about a, so this is the schedule, it's called the schedule, it's attachment A. So let's just go there. So this page, attachment A, is represented, you know, that's what comes out of here. Okay, this schedule is the most important part of your award because it's here where the agreement officer has put what they insist you comply with. Okay, so, and, and notice down here at A16, it talks about the standard and mandatory provisions. So that's just the attachment, of, uh, that's the C attachment that they're referring to. Okay, so everyone in your organization, I don't care if you're the technical guy or, you know, doesn't matter, you should all read, this is like 15, 16 pages, read the schedule. It has the dates you must comply with, the forms you must use, all these, you know, what, indirect cost rate or the de minimis, what to do with program income or cost share, where can you buy stuff from, all of that is in here, right? So please, please, let me just get my annotator going a little better for you, if I can... I think he's a highlighter here. There we go. Okay. So yeah, please make sure you, everyone reads this in great detail. Here's the document we're talking about. Here's where the procurement rules are. Okay. It gets updated every now and then. The last version you can see there. So I've got a, a strip at the bottom of my machine there. The version is October 24th, 2023. Okay. I think everyone should read this as well. You're saying, oh, Doug, it's 90 pages and it changes. It changes, but it's not a big deal because every time it changes, let me just go here and see what I got here. Every time it changes, all they, 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 they put in yellow what changed. So it makes it very easy. And in and, and this 2020, this sorry, 1024 version only had three changes and they're highlighted in yellow. Okay. And plus it even has in the document itself when it was last updated. So once you've read the rules, some of them go back, you know, 15, 20 years. Okay. So you don't need to reread rules that you already learned. Okay. Now in the uniform guidance, they've entered a concept that used to come from the government accountability office. And it's this concept of must versus should. Okay. And it says that what it basically says, they, they originally, they did it with auditors. I met the guy who created this, uh, Gil Tran. He's moved on to a large NGO in Washington now, unfortunately, but well, good for him, but I mean, bad for all the rest of us. And he was, uh, he's the brilliant guy who created the uniform guidance. He was also involved in the yellow book and, and for the auditor's guidelines, right? And in the yellow book, it said, it effectively says, auditors, if we say, the US government says, you must do something when you're doing your audits, you must do it or you're going to lose your license. Very, very significant rules. Okay. And then Gil saw how effective that was at auditors actually following the rules. And he said, let's bring that into the uniform guidance. Okay. So what that means is, you know, our, our, our training uh, coordinator, Rose, has done uh, a search. And in the uniform guidance itself, there's 884 of these instances of must, meaning in theory, auditors should be testing, are you doing it? Okay, now there's a lot of appendices and stuff, so don't let that number alarm you. But under just these USAID standard provisions, there's 315 musts and 38 must nots, which are just as important. Okay, that's a lot. So that's where we auditors come in. And let, that starts with, that's where your compliance person comes in. And she or he should be the one who learns these, what these are, and then figures out, do we do that? UIPs, are you doing all of these? And you're not going to do all of them because some of them are really uh, irregular, well, 
you know, unnecessary, but they are in there. So in theory, you're subject to risk. But there's probably 25, 30 that are specifically uh, material, meaning financially material, a big number. Getting those wrong, like procurement is very much one of these, then that could affect your financial statements and cause serious problems. Okay, So just be aware, do a quick search on your award and look for all the musts in the standard provisions themselves. And again, that's number is going to change when they, they change. But essentially, you know, assume there's 300 things you should be, you must be doing. Okay, must the mandatory. Okay, so we're talking about the rules. And I did say there's a light version. So let's just briefly go over. I've got USAID and CDC up here. USAID has the light version, but only for, for foreign, foreign organizations. So a US prime, an FHI, CARE, IntraHealth, Save the Children, World Vision, all those big US, all the universities, you know, the, the uh, Columbia's and Washington and Johns Hopkins, all what applies to them is the entire rule set, the total US government uh, guidelines in terms of the, the uniform guidance. And also, the USAID has their 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 baby, uh, not not the not the what I call the light version, but at two CFR seven hundred, there are some things that are unique to USAID, uh, like using the metric system and stuff. Okay, none of you have to worry about this, but I do have to say it. Okay, but the bottom line is the whole uniform guidance, two CFR two hundred, and the U.S. standard provisions. Let's go back a slide. Right, the U.S. provisions apply to the U.S. space guys. Okay. Now, what happens when they pass funds down to us? Okay, well, they pass down the non-U.S. version. Okay, so what applies to the non-U.S. subs is not the same thing that applies to the U.S. prompt. Okay, it's the light version. Okay, so read your sub-award IPs. What applies to you? It's within the sub-award and the standard provisions. And, of course, the cost principles. Okay, there's no, there's no light version of cost principles. Okay, I'll leave it at that unless people have some questions. Let's talk about what's probably more applicable for us. We've got non-US or you, a prime in your organizations across the world. Okay, so again, USA gives you the award that I just showed you, and that's all you have to read. Okay, as an auditor, I can only hold you to the rules that are in your award. Okay, that's called the, we would call it the Bob Strauss rule, which is the four corners concept. Okay. The four quarters concept is that remember, I you know your your awards used to come on paper, and paper has four corners. And that concept from Bob Strauss is for a rule to apply to you, it must be in your award. Okay, in it or referred to in it. Okay, so read your award. There's a lot, there's dozens and dozens and hundreds of rules that don't apply to you. So don't, you know, don't worry about them. If it's not in your award, then it doesn't apply to you. As an auditor, I can't hold you. Uh, to a rule that's not in your award. Now, this is a problem when a, when a prime gives a bad award to a sub. Okay, is it as even though I'm auditing a sub and, and, I, and there's a, there's something missing, I can't hammer you for it. Right, I can say, look, I would get ready if the sub if the prime ever fixes your your errant sub award, then you know you'll have to be compliant. Okay, so just that's so much important to read your award. Okay, so a not a, a foreign prime will call you uh, is going to get your award from USAID and what you have to comply with. And if you want to read it, go to standard provision number one, but it makes it clear. Follow the, what the award says and the cost principles. Same thing at the primer sub-level. Now, I believe USAID in their wisdom, when they tried to go to uh, you know, localization, they said, okay, but you know what? You used to be under a FHI or a, a Johns Hopkins or a, a Columbia or you know whoever, uh, IntraHealth. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to make them a sub to you to help you out from below, sort of support. Okay, which is great conceptually, but it's a little bit hard in the, in the sense that, uh, that we talk about the prime, the, not, the foreign prime is going to have the light version of the, of the rules, but the sub doesn't. The sub has the full version. So effectively, the foreign prime has to manage the sub with rules that they do not, they themselves, the prime doesn't actually follow. So that could cause some problems. Just be careful. I mean, what USA is well intended in this. But just be careful, you need very switched on people if you're going to manage U.S. based subs. Okay, so when do these rules kick in? I'm talking about now the, what's in your award. Be careful when an agreement officer creates your award. Okay, he or she has to basically uh, incorporate the, the then current version of the guidelines at that time. Okay, but then they change. Okay, so now what happens? Well, when they change, the theory is from the day the change is implemented, when you get in it, when you in your award gets a uh, they make a modification. OK, 
And so then they send you an amendment to it, or uh, yeah, they, they send you a, 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 a modification, I'm trying to think of the word here. But regardless, you get, normally it's when they're giving you more money, they will then update your award. And so be, be careful that, you know, until that, until that, uh, that, that change comes, you're still following the old rules. Now I would start to transition to the new rules as soon as you can. But from an auditing point of view, the day they give you that modification, uh, then the new, new rule kicks in. Okay, so just be careful there. And, and But continue. Remember, all they're telling you is the old rules are out, the new rules are in. It's your job to go through and read what they what the, what, what what changed there. But okay, be careful that you need, still need to follow. Let's go back up to here. This what, the attachment A, the schedule. You know what may change is these standard provisions down here at A sixteen in this example. But all this other stuff hasn't necessarily changed unless the agreement officer changed it. Okay, so a lot of the stuff that is in you know procurement exactly right here geographic code where we can buy stuff from. Okay. That, if they didn't change that, then you know that didn't change regardless of what it says in your in your standard provisions. So make sure you you read uh, you keep up to date with uh, you know what is in your award and especially Schedule A. Okay. So all we're going to say in Q and A, I think we do have one, Melissa. I'll turn it over to you for a second. Give people ears a break. Yeah, we do have um, one question. Related to when USAID makes changes, if USAID makes changes in the middle of your award or perhaps when you're implementing your award, um, which rules should you follow when those um, changes are made? Okay, good question. So, um, you know, again, your award comes with as a complete package with, the, in theory, the then current. When the AO, you know, sort of finally sends it, he says, he or she says, okay, well, what's, you know, what, what are the standard attachments? Great, let's attach them, then they're current. Then they change reasonably frequently now, maybe once or twice a year. And then that's why I said that. So, so it, it, what it says, again, this isn't the whole compliance course, it's just procurement, but, but it, part of our requirement, when we sign up to receive USAID money, we agree implicitly to we agree to comply with the and, and sign up for it's called an implementing partner notice portal. And so when USAID is going to make a broadcast change about something, then they will send you a note, all IPs, you're meant to sign up for this. There's a contract version and a cooperative agreement version. Okay, they're not the same necessarily. I'd sign up for both, to be honest. But uh, they'll send you a note saying, look, your award's going to change. Be aware. Here's what the change is going to be. Uh, you may wish, you IPs may wish to contact your agreement officer and ask her or him when your award is going to be modified. So they effectively put you on notice that your award is going to change. And then at that point, you probably should start migrating to the new rule. But officially, if I'm wearing my auditor hat, I'm going to hold you to that new rule when uh, your award was amended. Okay, And that normally comes, as I say, normally when, when they're giving you additional incremental funding, when you're increasing your uh, obligated funds, then they'll attach the standard provisions. They'll attach the change. I don't think, you know, that this uh, changing the provisions is not a big thing in most AO's lives. So it's probably only going to be coming into effect when effectively your, they'll send you an amendment and saying, please change this. Okay, good question. Okay, so uh, again, we don't have time to go through all of these and what we have, but these standard, there's a lot of these standard provisions. Now, M means mandatory. Okay, the guidelines come in two sections. One, mandatory, which means you must do all these things. And then there's, so there's M, so you can see all the M's. And then there is the RAAs, which means required as applicable. And so these are only relevant to you if your award does these things, okay? In this example, you know, ocean shipment of goods. Well, some of you do ocean shipment. Maybe you have a PL 480 or a food aid or, or something like that, uh, or, you know, shipping fertilizers or whatever else. And most of us won't. Most of us in the PEPFAR area probably don't have O's and shipment. So that one wouldn't apply to you. It's only as applicable. Okay, so I'm just highlighting that. So it's all of these rules, all these various, sorry, let me just move this up here. All of these rules, um, let me go back to here, have some uh, applicab uh, applicability from a procurement point of view. A lot of people don't realize this. You say, oh, no, M5 and M6, that's procurement. Yeah, but there's other stuff as well. Okay, so we're going to go through uh, many of these and the ones that I think are important where I think you may be subject to risk. Okay, and then, of course, the cost principles, things that uh, that do have a you know procurement-related type uh, thing that needs possibly prior approvals. So we'll talk about that. 
Okay, so jump straight in to policy M5, which is procurement. This is the process upon which we UIPs are supposed to use when you're buying stuff. Okay, and notice this big must right up the top. The recipient must use your own procurement policies, procedures, provided that they comply with the my term significant requirements in this USAID provision. Okay, most in my history of 42 years of, of auditing and working with, well, more than that auditing, but 42 years working with the US government, most NGOs would not have as sophisticated a procurement process than the US government requires. Okay, so if you're new to the game, a new US government uh, partner, you're gonna have to buck up and, and, and tighten up your controls and add certain things for procurement. That's just one of the big requirements and it's for good reason. Okay, so five is about the process and the policies, and six is the, where we can and cannot buy stuff from. So we'll talk about that in a few more minutes. Okay, now another must, you must maintain procurement in written policies and procedures. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about the threshold areas. Micro purchase threshold is $10,000 or whatever threshold you set. So the concept is that that uh, the original OMB came out with uh, what they called the bear claw, and it was a procurement bear claw. In America, the North American bear has like five fingers, of course, claws, but there's sort of five fingers with, with, uh, with, with it's a claw. And the whole point is each of those is a different type of procurement. And, uh, you know, the bottom line is anything under the micro purchase threshold, which started at 3000 and now has been bumped to 10,000. Okay. Anything under $10,000 has a lot of leniency. You don't necessarily need competition. You just have to round robin your preferred vendors and things like that. Okay, now in America, 10,000 is micro purchase, not overseas, right? For most of us, that is a significant procurement. So most organizations lower their threshold to something about maybe $1,000, $2,000, where they, you know, they're, they're more careful. They're prudent with the U.S. government funds. Okay, so just be careful. Some of these micro purchase thresholds, you know, you, you need to understand, your guy, he or she needs to understand that. Okay, so the written procedures have to basically say, when over that, whatever threshold you set that micro purchase, okay, they have to be conducted in a fair, unbiased competition. U.S. government loves competition. Why? Because in theory, in an open market, competition will give you the best value. You look around, you say, I need this, and this guy's selling it for $5,000, this guy four or five, what's the difference? I'm looking at it, but you know, generally you'll get a, a reasonable deal, assuming you do your due diligence on you know, the product you're buying. Okay, so you got to be careful here. All oh, notice, all responsible sources have to be committed to uh, permitted to compete. Okay, so when you get an award, guys, go out and say who are the vendors who could supply this to us, and create a consider creating a preferred vendor list. So you can show your auditors when they start to ask you who did you reach out for to show you had competition. You could say, look at the beginning here, we found six suppliers of X office supplies or reagents or whatever we're getting. And there's your preferred vendor list. Then you need to reach out to them when you are going for uh, your next procurements. Okay, you need to be very clear. And we're gonna have an example at the end of this course if we have time about what a, what a procurement process would look like. But basically you've gotta explain what are you gonna evaluate them on? It's not just price, okay? Be very careful. It shouldn't just be price because you know the quality could suffer. So let's say you need a generator. Here in South Africa, we're having power outages three times a day. And so you need a generator, okay? NGOs will need a generator. So what do I need? Well, not just a generator, how big? How many KVA, how, you know, how powerful? The diesel or petrol, okay? Do you need a muffler or a silencer or does it not matter? Yeah, and these sort of things. What sort of, what sort of uh, how many 24 hour policy on repairing it? All that stuff should be important and price, okay? So that's the whole point. Just make sure you identified how we are going to evaluate uh, uh, your your offer. And then make sure that when your, your procurement team gets these responses, that they actually do evaluate them against those factors. Okay, so you probably need some sort of scoring mechanism. Okay, maybe 30% is based on price, but you know, the other factors like again, the 24, you know, what what policy do you have for for uh your replacement parts? What guarantee do you have? And or delivery, whatever else. Okay. All that should be what you, you have to prove to the auditor that you did evaluate them accordingly. Okay, let's not, well, I'm not going to go through all these, but you're encouraged to use U.S. small businesses. So do try to see what U.S. businesses are operating in your country and so forth. I mean, this is quite a long one. I'll just pick the important ones. Make sure 
you have some sort of make this one's very important lease purchase option a lot of people don't realize you should be determining did you need to buy this stuff now most people do a five-year project i'm going to buy the vehicle of course it's going to be che cheaper than leasing the vehicle but what happens in year five when the car breaks down and now you need a vehicle for x months or for a year does it make sense now to buy one or could you lease? Okay, so just have on file. And again, your procurement guys, I'm, I'm just giving you the exposure here on why you need a person that she or he studies these in greater detail. Okay, you need to document your lease purchase uh, de determination. Okay, make sure you get what you pay for. And then we'll talk about GRNs, goods received note. Okay, when you do a procurement, of course, your procurement guys are going to buy the stuff, but eventually it's going to come in a door somewhere. And who is, you know, does they have a receiving doc? Who's receiving it? Do they know what they're supposed to get? Are they actually getting what you order? Okay, conflicts of interest come out throughout here. We'll talk a little bit later about this, but just be sure, you know, normally the people who buy stuff who are spending the NGO's money may have a conflict. You know, they buy from friends or family or whatever else. They're always subject to, to uh, unfortunately, they're subject to influence uh, because they're the ones actually approving that you're funding. Okay, so just make sure you all have at the board level, at the procurement level, uh, probably every employee should sign some sort of a conflict of interest policy that they're aware of. Okay, the developer of a terms of reference or RFP shouldn't compete for it. This happens all the time. You know, as an auditor, well, let's just say this. I mean, we we do a lot of the you know, stuff for, for like you and people say, Doug, can you guys do this? Can you help us with the risk assessment? Yeah, of course we can. Great. Can you write us a terms of reference for it? Well, no, they just said, but can't you do it? Yeah, we can, but we can't write the terms of reference or scope of work because in theory, we'd favor ourselves. So that's what we auditors look for. We look to see, did you contract for anything? Did you buy anything that needed sort of technical services? And then we'll ask you who wrote the terms of reference. So just be careful. Okay, I'm gonna leave it at that. The procurement, as I say, there's a lot of things here. Just make sure you maintain your records for three years. Remember, that's the, the, the U.S. government's record retention policy is you have to keep your full five-year program records for an additional three years after the date of the final expenditure report. So it's basically an eight-year period you're keeping those documents. Most of your countries have a longer period. Most of your countries will have a five-year or seven-year. or Some countries have a 10-year uh, retention policy. So just be careful there. Now, who's going to pay for that record keeping? Right. Who's going to pay for it? USAID only requires it three years, yet your country requires more. U.S. government's policy is you must comply with your own country's rules and USAID's rules. OK, so if, if, the, if your government says we must keep your records for another five years, then USAID, unfortunately, says, OK, well, that's a rule. We're going to have to pay for it. OK, so just be careful on making sure you do keep all your records. That's a whole other discussion, but record keeping is essential. Okay, now next, I'm not going to go, as I say, I'm just exposing you. We're still in M5. Uh, make sure that you are doing the right sort of purchase order, if you will. As I said, the different sizes could, could equate to different types of requirements. If you have a contract under your award, so most of us have a cooperative agreement. It is possible to have a contract under your award. Now, let's not call it a subcontract. It's called a contract under a grant or a CUG, a CUG. So you can have a contract. So many of you, some of you do uh, PEPFAR. Some of you are maybe care and treatment or something. And then some of you may have male circumcision under that. Okay, well, male circumcision is normally done under contract. It's not done under a cooperative agreement because you pay the guy, whatever, $85 to do the procedure. The doctor, you know, they don't get paid per hour and things like that. Okay, so again, if you've got questions, put it in the Q&A. So um, under that situation, there are contract provisions those are at appendix number two of the uh, uniform guidance. Okay, I'm gonna leave it at that for that. Okay, so now we're into M6. And now, so again, that was the procedures we needed, M5. Six is who, what we can and cannot buy and who we can and cannot buy it from. Okay, so these are ineligible commodities and services. You can assume you're not gonna buy any of these things with your US government money and probably wouldn't be buying it for the project anyway. So it wouldn't be the type of stuff the U.S. government would want you to be doing. So military equipment, guns and things like that, surveillance equipment, meaning outright spying. Okay, now a lot of people use drones these days, and I've asked some of my favorite agreement officer, 
is a drone a spying thing? He goes, no, it's not. I mean, if you need a drone, make sure you you document it, but use the drone for its intended purpose, please. Okay, you're not going to be buying truncheons and, and, and things for supporting police and law enforcement. Abortion, as you know, is very uh, politically fraught between the Democrats and Republicans. But, you know, U.S. government never allowed you to provide for the abortion themselves or this equipment. Okay, now there'll be, of course, many family planning. The Marie Stopes and a lot of people who do family planning and women's rights. Uh, and a lot of that is approved, but not the abortions themselves. Okay, luxury good. Let's not worry about that. Weather modification. Technology is getting pretty good these days. So uh, at some point, you know, we may come to cloud seeding and other technology that enables creating weather. Uh, we that'll never be allowed because it'll be a conspiracy, you know, that the U.S. government is changing things for who knows what. OK, so th those are the things assume you will never buy with U.S. government funds. OK, then who can we buy and who can we not buy from? So we're at six still, but under 12 and 14 coming up in a few minutes, we will talk about uh, the two, the actually three lists now that you have to make sure you're buying from people who are not on these lists. I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, these are the restricted commodities, still M6. So before we had ineligible, couldn't buy. Now these are restricted items. These you need specific prior written approval from your agreement officer, okay? So basically a lot of you may be doing economic development, farming, huge about a, uh, the amount of the controls there. This also to, talks about seeds and certain types of fertilizers and things. At the bottom, we have fertilizer. We have agricultural commodities, very touchy. Okay, many countries are GMO and resistant, genetically modified organism resistant. And, uh, you know, they don't want Monsanto or Bayer or other seed in there that starts to, you know, potentially concern, uh, you know, the people about health and safety. So very touchy there, learn these rules. Motor vehicles, again, most of us have motor vehicles. I'm sure they need prior approval. Pharmaceuticals, a lot of you in the PEPFAR HIV space, uh, they used to require uh, FDA, U.S. Federal Drug Administration approval, not necessarily anymore. India makes incredibly useful, cost-effective uh, uh, generics. So, but there's normally an NGO or, or actually there's a contract, U.S. government contract to buy most of the pharmaceuticals. So chances are you're not going to be buying your own. Okay, pesticides, President's Malaria Initiative, just like HIV, the PEPFAR, there's a President's PMI across most of that, well, much of Africa. Okay, there's certainly the central part where, uh, you know, it's about reducing or eliminating, uh, you know, malaria. And a lot of those people have spraying and there's incredibly strict rules about pesticides. And let's just jump down to fertilizer. We know how dangerous fertilizer can be. Uh, just go try to find the port of Lebanon right now and uh, you will see Beirut doesn't exist, part of it, uh, because it blew up. Okay, so just be careful with those things. You know, they're obviously for multiple reasons, safety or otherwise politically sensitive things, genetic GMO type stuff. Uh, be careful of buying that. Okay, now where is you, are you or your, your, your person going to find more information? Uh, a lot of these rules are still incorporated in 22 CFR 228. Now I told, you know, two CFR 200 is where the uniform guidance is, but section 22 was foreign operations. So there's a lot of rules there for what we can buy and how we buy stuff overseas. That's where a lot of information is uh, and or talk to your agreement officer. Every mission has a procurement specialist. It may not be your AO, but he or she will know who it is in your mission. And they're very helpful. I mean, don't be afraid to call the missions. You know, their job is there to help you spend the money. They don't, they don't give you money and ask you to fail. They want you to be successful. Okay, now geographic codes, we'll briefly talk about this. There are a number of different geographic codes. These can be found. These geographic code, the basic ones are 935 and 937. So 935 is the more basic one, which just says developing countries. Where can we, you know, a developing country, where, so, you know, most of you are probably developing countries. Uh, a couple countries are advanced developing, the 937s, which would be South Africa, Namibia, Mauritius, you know, uh, you know, other other what are a little bit more advanced countries that are still developing. Where can you get these lists? They're at ADS, which means go to USA.gov, ADS uh, uh, 310. There's a number of lists under there of the 935, 937, 941, and whatever else. Okay, so just be aware your award may. Let me just zip back up there. Okay, let's go back up to your award here. Notice under A10 here it talks about the authorized geographic code. 
Well, that's where it's going to tell you. What is your country? Where can you buy stuff from? Okay, so again, you got to learn the rules. Read your award and have your procurement guy make sure he or she learns all these rules. Okay, okay. So I'm going to leave it at that. And that the whole point is, again, I said the AO, she or he will be able to give you guidance here or point you in the right direction. But be careful. Okay, if you don't follow the procurement rules, unfortunately, the auditors could have a field day. Now, most findings that we auditors find are related to timekeeping, you know, bad timekeeping, bad timesheet, stuff like that. But a close second is we have findings based on procurement that you didn't follow the rules. Okay, so please read the rules, follow the rules. Okay, at N12 and 14, this is where these lists exist that where you can't buy stuff from these people. So the first one is now, it's, it used to be called the Excluded Parties List System, or EPLS. That's been moved to SAM.gov. SAM is the catch-all site now for many U.S. government activities. Okay, SAM means System for Award Management. Every prime must be registered on SAM. Okay, a, a sub doesn't need to be registered on SAM, but the prime must be. A sub does need primes. Your sub needs these UEIs, the Unique Entity Identifier. And you get that on SAM.gov. Okay, so that's uh, uh, you know people say, well, why doesn't the sub need to be on SAM? Well, they don't. They don't. The U.S. government doesn't necessarily need to know about the subs, but they must have a unique identity identifier, unique entity. Okay, the bottom line is these lists contain the people who the U.S. government doesn't want you to do business with. Okay, so where do we find it? You go to SAM.gov. Beautiful site. We are looking looking for exclusions. And so great, you type in the name of the organization or also don't forget your people. You can't do business with, meaning you can't employ people who are on these lists. So for all of these lists I'm talking about, you need to run your people and your vendors through these, these uh, systems to make sure that they're not available, or sorry, not on there. How often? There's no rule, I say at least annually, and no one's ever been hammered for not you know, doing it annually. Uh, but certainly before you hire someone or buy from an organization, you should be running them through these lists, these, these checks, okay? So here we put in the Guptas because the Gupta family was a group that ripped off South Africa for about 10 years for billions and billions of dollars. And so USAID put them on the list. They were uh, added to the list, okay? We used to call it the DUNS number. Now it's unique identity, you know, UEI that we're aware of, okay? And so the bottom line is here is an example that these guys are on the list, okay? So let's carry on. So how about sustainability solutions? Are we on the list? So we search for us. I'm gonna show you where we searched. And, and yes, we are in SAM.gov because we do work for the government, but we're not on here. So what you need to do, IP, is you do the search and would you find the Guptas? Yes. Would you find sustainability? No. You got service planting, synergy. If we were on the list, we'd be listed here. Okay, so that's what you have to do. You type in up here, you type in sustainability solutions, and boom, or whatever your, your, your people, your, your suppliers are, and hopefully you don't find them. Okay? So all of you will have this SAM listing. Everyone just be aware, there's a lot of information publicly available about anyone who does business with the US government. This is where I'm showing this unique identity, unique entity identifier that used to be a DUNS number. And you'll notice even in the old, oh, the old searches, they still call it a DUNS number stroke unique identity ID. Okay, So each of you is going to have that. Okay, that was 12, so do that for all your people and then uh, and your, your vendors, same thing for 14. Now this is under, basically this is the, the, the special designated nationals, blocked people, and this is under treasury.gov. Okay, so that's what it looks like. Now, unfortunately, this website has changed and they've made it very difficult to find where this is. It used to just be exclusions and things like that. I had to search for a while, but, you know, every now and then we update these slides and where that is is under OFAC. Office of Foreign Asset Control. And so then you look at the sanctions list and that's still what you're looking for as the SDN list, okay? And you'll go there. And so it'll, eventually you get to a search bar and you type in whatever, sustainability solutions, and you will find that, great, your search has not returned any uh, results, which is good. Okay, now what do you need to, how do you document this? Okay, well, what you do is you would do these searches and then you get here and you go print screen, print screen. For Joe, for Tom, for Malicia, for you know whatever, for Ali, you print screen and put it in the HR file or in the vendor file. Okay, keep it for all your employees and all your vendors. Okay, there's a third one, United Nations Security Council. This one we also must do. 
Now, unfortunately, the guidelines aren't so clear. They say this or this. They say 12, this one, OFAC, or this one. But it's actually an and. I've double checked this with experts. It's an and. So you, you know, you're all saying, well, why don't I just have one list? Well, they don't. Okay, sorry. Okay, because remember, the US government doesn't necessarily work in all the countries that you may be working in. Okay, they don't, or, or that you may be doing something or buying things from. So the whole point is you got to double or, or do this third uh, check as well. Okay, and that's what your search looks like there. And again, we're not on the UN list either. Okay, so I would, maybe I'm going to take a break here. Just uh, let, let, let's Melissa, let, I see we have a couple questions. Maybe help me out here. What's uh, what's hot? What's the topic? Yeah. We have a question here about um, when, what to do if you have um, limited options for vendors. So if perhaps there's only one vendor in your country, um, what procedure should you follow in that case? Okay, great question. So if there's only one vendor, that is almost like a sole source. Now, you'd certainly want to get approval from USA. You'd explain, dear USA, dear AO, uh, we are going to buy X. Uh, in our country, there's only one supplier of X. Um, and yeah, and then just get their approval. Now that, that's not, put it this way, if there's only one sub vendor in the country, that's not going to be a surprise to USAID. Uh, now they may wonder, depending on what you're buying, you know, they're going to may say, you know, cast the net wider. Uh, how about Europe? You know, if you're buying like medical equipment and stuff like that, I mean, maybe smaller handheld things. A lot of those are, are in Sweden and other sort of Northern European countries who are great at medical stuff. Maybe they say, well, just double check that that's not available there. Okay. So Yes, just I would I would notify USAID. Here's what we've done, dear USAID. Are you aware of any other people who could supply the any other organizations that could supply these goods? Okay, and if they don't get a reply, then uh, I would say you've done your due diligence. Next question. Thank you. Yeah, we have a question here about the how about the Bob Strauss rule, um, and yeah. how that rule uh, kind of correlates with the rules that auditors use during the internal policies work. Um, how could you respond to an auditor's finding with using the Bob yeah. Strauss rule? Okay, so that's a good question. Okay, so Bob, I, 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 let me just suggest, I'm not punting this just for the sake of punting it. I mean, he's an absolute global guru. He he trained USAID AOs for five years. Okay, so most of the, well, they're probably retired now. But, so I would recommend you consider signing up for his newsletter. It's it's, it's uh, uh, www. Was it? It's, uh, or send him an email at Strauss. Strauss, S-T-R-O-S-S, -S -S, uh, at, uh, at uh, robertstrausschartered.net, okay? Strauss, S-T-R-O-S-S, -S, at robertstraussechartered.net, okay? Every, day, every month you get an incredible newsletter, about 70 pages of every factoid you need to be a good partner, okay? But what Bob is referring to there, when I call the Bob Strauss Four Corners concept, it is also at standard provision number one, okay? Standard provision number one of the document that we've been talking about, okay? And that's, I'm gonna read it to you, okay? Obviously, you're, I, mean, I, I couldn't pull it up right now, but the number one is about allowable costs. And it says, M1, quote, the recipient will be reimbursed for costs incurred in carrying out the purposes of the award, of this award, in accordance with the terms of this award, meaning the document itself, and the applicable cost principles in effect on the date of this award. Okay, that's it. It's the award and the cost principles. So go back and read your award. Let me zip back up there, right? That's what you're talking about. It is this award. That's it. The award and the cost principles. And it says in M1, of course, the cost principles for us overseas, the non-US organizations. Well, it doesn't matter. There's only one set of cost principles. That is the 2 CFR 200 or that subpart E. Okay, let's go back here. The subpart E over here, that's what it is. Okay, So it's your award and these cost principles. That's it. You know, because so, I mean, this is not the audit report. I mean, again, the, the audit... You know, we, we do a lot more in auditing in our March course. If you're interested, our email's at the end of this. But, but you know, an audit has what's called a finding. And a finding has what's called four elements. The four elements of a finding are criteria, condition, cause, and effect. And the criteria is what the auditor must have. They must be able to point to your award and say, you broke this rule. 
Okay. And so if it's not in your award, then you got to say, well, what's the criteria? And to free, we work with the inspector general up the street here quite regularly. And, and uh, you know, and we ask him for inputs into our presentations. And one of the things that the bugbear is that for, for them is that too many auditors claim good governance or you should have done something in their finding. And that's not good enough. You need to have broken a rule. Okay. So that's the whole point. Show me. If an auditor starts saying to you, oh, you did something wrong, you say, show me where that is required in my award. If it's not there, then you don't require it. Okay. And then USA will back you up on that. Then your inspector general will agree. And so, you know, again, we don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but never accept any sort of dissing or, 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 or a claim from an auditor you did something wrong unless they can prove it. Okay. I'm a bit emphatic about that, but as a, an auditor, I, I see too many bad audits. And that's why it's going to be critical that you hire good auditors in the next audit cycle. Okay. Next question, please. Sure. This one is related to um, maintenance and repairs RFPs. So usually contractors conduct an assessment um, as a part of their uh, quote. Um, they, in essence, develop their own proposed scopes of work based on their expertise. Is it acceptable to select the most suitable of those and ask others to quote on the same kind of scope of work um, and still include the contractor in that proposed does that make sense on the proposed selected RFP? So if, if a contractor goes and does um, an assessment of your space, for example, you need to repair your roof, is it acceptable to use then that same scope of work that the expert provided when con trying to contract others? Yeah, I mean, I would say be incredibly careful on that. I mean, it might depend on the on, on what we're talking about. You know, you talked about a roof. Well, I mean, there's a lot of roof contractors. Why don't you go get three quotes? Okay, but you know, you're talking about, I mean, I, normally when I say scope of work or terms of reference, I'm talking about creating a policy or, or you know, creating a, a new user manual or your risk assessment report or something like that. I mean, getting a quote for a roof is not, I mean, the scope of that is, guys, my roof is buggered. I need, you know, that your scope of work is fix the roof. So, you know, so that, that could, that, there's many ways to maybe interpret that question, but I would say if there's ever a doubt ask USAID here, dear AO. And when you write to the AO guys, just be careful how you're writing. You are writing to get an answer. Okay, don't go airy-fairy, explain all the situation. Just say, dear AO, here's a situation. They're very busy people. Say, here's a situation. We need this. Uh, we need, again, fixing the roof. We're gonna have, we propose to have this and this and this. Is this acceptable? Okay, and then just get their approval. If you've got their approval as an auditor, I no longer have a dog in the fight. I accept whatever the AO has has said you can do, you can do. Okay, next question. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, there was a question I believe you um, answered already, but perhaps you can answer again for folks. Um, it says, when conducting your due diligence checks, um, do you need to use various different checks, the UN check and the SAM um, or, or is there, do you only need to use one? No, all three. You must do all of them because they're different lists. Remember, there's a, the, the, the SAM.gov is for people who may have been fraudulent or something like that. And then the, the Treasury.gov, the OFAC, is the terrorist list. Okay. And then the, you're not going to be on all three. You know, people would, would be on, on one or the other. And then the UN one's more recent. But that is, again, because, you know, the U.S. government doesn't necessarily... Well, let's just say this. They, they they assume that if someone's on the UN bad list, then it's also bad enough for the US government. Okay, so yes, I think you need, unfortunately, you need all three. Good, next question. Yeah, this one's about um, donor requirements and how they flow down to um, suppliers. So do your donor requirements, your USA donor requirements have to flow down to your suppliers for goods and services? If so, what what does that look like for an organization? Okay, good question. So in the guidelines themselves, they say which ones are required as passed down provisions. And some of the ones we're going to be talking about now in the next sort of half hour are specifically for your vendors when it comes to working with children and other sorts of you know, sex workers and, and conflicts of interest and things like that. A lot of them do need to flow down to your vendors as well. So that's why procurement is tough. And I say tough, meaning, you know, you got to learn these rules and 
No, you're at risk. You're at serious risk. If if a procurement goes wrong, the U.S. government or USAID has the right to you know basically cancel the whole procurement. You know, you may have done just one little thing wrong. Maybe you didn't declare a conflict of interest. They can say, ah, you know, the whole thing rejected. So yeah, I think yeah, there are passed down provisions, and that's where USAID's pretty good. It specifically says in the guidelines. It says in here these are this provision must be passed down. Okay, so that is, I think aid does a pretty good job of making their, their rules clear, but they also do a good job of making themselves available. So there's no reason, guys, the only thing, you know, the gray areas can only hurt the IPs. USA doesn't get hurt by a gray area. I mean, because they are the ones who, who are going to uh, apply the rules and, and, and be the judge. Uh, auditors don't get hurt by the by gray areas. So you do. So you don't want any gray areas. And what you do is, you know, when you do your proposal, that's the time. When you're doing your proposal, anything that's not in the cost principles, any any cost that's not in there, you incorporate it uh, in, in your 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 uh, your budget narrative, and you highlight that this specific. We did cost principles a couple months ago. It might well, I'm not sure if it's still there, but um, the whole point is 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 uh, uh, you know, if you're not sure, ask. And we'll be seeing that. As a matter of fact, at 407. For prior approvals, we'll be talking about that in a few more minutes. Okay, thank you. Next question. Yeah, that that cost principle um, webinar will be available for just a couple more days, so it's on the ASAP Resources page for those who are interested in that. Um, the next question um, is about comparative bid analysis. So, can a comparative bid analysis be a basis to test the reasonability cost and principle? Ooh, say that again. Can a comparative bid analysis be you be a basis to test the reasonable reasonability cost principle? Okay, uh, good question. Okay, so that gets a bit deep, but let's go into there. So, for any cost to be allowable to the federal government, it must be reasonable, allocable, allowable, and supported, meaning documented in paperwork. Okay, so you're asking about the reasonableness. So. Not necessarily the fact that you did a cost comparison uh, that, um, so you're looking for a computer and one guy comes in at $7,000 and one's at six five and one's at six and you pick the whatever, the six saying, okay, well, that was competitive. Ultimately the auditor, the auditor is the ultimate arbiter of reasonableness. Okay, and the US government relies on the auditor to determine whether it was. And so reasonableness, it's called the prudent person rule. Right. That is prudent person rule is what is it? It's a uh, number 404 cost principle. And the prudent person rule says we are all careful with our own money. Right. When you got paid yesterday or a couple of days ago or today, you're careful with that money. The U.S. government prudent person rule says be as careful and prudent with their money as you are with your own. And then it's reasonable. OK, so the fact that you're going through competition would lend some credence to reasonableness. But still, the auditor is going to look and say, all right, well, you spent six, but, you know, those three vendors were in cahoots or you don't know. There could have been some reason why that wasn't actually a good deal. So all I'm saying is price competition doesn't guarantee that we're still going to determine it to be reasonable. But very good question. OK, just I'll just take two more and then we'll, you know, we've got to keep going here. Move on. Yeah. Um, the next question is specifically about surveillance equipment. So they ask if surveillance equipment is not allowed to be procured, um, how how then do you provide uh, safety for employees? So is there a, a kind of exception for? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, good equipment. question. So, okay. So, you know, that's okay. I, I said drones as an example, but surveillance equipment to protect your employees, the parking lot, stuff like that, those are perfectly acceptable. You know, things on the gates, things on the on the driveways, those are 100% uh, acceptable. We're talking about spying equipment, you know, literally surveillance meaning spying, it means you're doing some sort of surveillance. I mean, that U.S. government doesn't do any sort of spying through the USAID. I mean, it would be a different agency if it was, but for our purposes, uh, that's just not going to happen under USAID. So, no, uh, all your all your security cam. Now, be careful. We're going to talk about cameras. Make sure later on we're going to talk about which cameras you can't use. You can't use the Chinese tech vision cameras, which are the global standard. OK, but no, uh, that's not spying when you keep track of your people. When I say keep track of your people uh, for security purposes, for gates, doors, parking lots, that kind of stuff. 
hundred percent, those are accepted. Okay, one more. Last question for this. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this uh, participant asks about contractors who have previously been kind of disbarred or not allowed to do business with USG, um, with the US government. It, after that term has ended, um, is it possible to work with them again? How might you know when yeah. you can or can't? Yeah, let's go back there. Let's go back there. So under our SAM.gov, and so again, what was it? So you go to SAM.gov, and then you type in the name you're looking for, the search, and that search is going to turn out basically what I showed you. It would show you uh, this, This. Uh, sorry, let me see if I've got that up. Uh, it would, it, you know, it would say this search returned no, it returned no, uh, no, no results, just like the other one I showed you here, right? This one, I think this, I'm sorry, I got too many things open on my screen here. Yeah, your search returned no, no, uh, you know, no incidents. That's what you would do. So you just, you just search in the name and then that's it. That's all you find. So now you're asking for, so let's just go back to this list here. Well, it tells you how long the guys are on the list for. Okay. So it could be indefinite or the guy is on for a certain period. So depending on the on the foul, it could be five years or it could be more. This one's obviously for quite a while for this guy. Uh, but yeah, once once that once that guy, once once they basically once that date comes, so once May, March 5th, 2014 came, this guy disappeared. Or sorry, no, indefinite termination date. So go down to here, June 27th. A couple of years from now, on June twenty eighth, this guy in theory would disappear, and then he would he they would be available for uh, for uh, procurement again. Okay, okay. Let 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 maybe just save those extra ones, and then we'll we'll come back to those uh, if we have time because those are great ones. Okay, so let's just quickly go through some more of these, and thank you for all the questions. So uh, just quickly, uh, non discrimination. Now, again, you wouldn't think necessarily that this has, what does this have to do procurement? But it does say, it does say in some places that, you know, when we have subrecipients and vendors, they have to have such policies in law that they don't discriminate against people as well. So discrimination is quite an important thing for the U.S. government that we don't do it. Okay. And I'm just highlighting, you know, that, that I'm highlighting that in, in, in some of these instances, there's wording that says, uh, you know, vendors uh, have to also incorporate our non-discrimination policies, okay? Uh, you cannot force people, and this is of course also for our subs as well, that they have internal confidentiality agreements on uh, you know, not uh, whistleblowing and uh, reporting frauds and things like that. Uh, some of that relates to procurement as well, okay? Just very briefly, child safeguarding. The important point here is, you know, many of us would have many, some of you would have orphans or things like that. And you have to make sure not only the prime understands that when they deal with children, they can't take their pictures and they have to be careful that there's no abuse of the kids and things like that. It's not just you prime, it's all your contractors and vendors as well and the sub recipients. Okay. So you, you may have, you know, your kids are so important that, you know, the U S government's very careful, make sure they're not abused on, on their programs or hopefully anyone. Okay. Conflict of interest. I've already mentioned this a couple of times. Uh, in procurement is the most common type where there would be conflicts of interest. And so there we have to make sure our employees do declare in writing uh, their conflict of interest. Uh, well, uh, employers or, or NGOs, you need to have a policy that you make sure your people read and they understand it. And this M28, those of you in procurement, go to M28 because this one now has T. Okay? And it's got penalties if you don't notify your AO within 10 days of, note of, of learning that you had a conflict. Okay, then they can disallow the cost. Okay, so you know within ten days you think, oh, you know, so say say my my spouse or your spouse is a manager of an IT company, and your organization needs new computers, and your spouse comes home and says, hey, honey, uh, this weekend we're having a sale on of those computers, and if I'm not mistaken, doesn't your NGO use those ASUS, Dell, whatever computers? You say, yeah. She goes, well, there's a big sale on. OK, well, that's great that you know that. OK, and it's not that's not necessarily inside information, but you're conflicted. Your spouse works there. So you have to say to USAID, hey, OK, we've got uh, here's a situation. We're going to be considering buying computers from this store. And uh, the spouse is a uh, related party. OK, 
So just, you know, so what do you do? So then you have to, in theory, the process of removing yourself from that conflict. So the IT manager or whatever, the NGO would have to say, great, uh, well, how we're going to rectify this is he or she is going to not be part of the vendor process and not make the decisions and all this. That information has to be declared to your AO. And the problem is they have 30 days to determine whether your manner of rectifying it, meaning taking the guy off the decision committee, is adequate. So no one's going to wait 30 days. The sales this weekend. In that situation, if they go ahead and buy it, and then you know, it doesn't matter if they got a good deal or bad deal. If they buy it and later on USA says, but hang on, there's a conflict here, they could throw out that whole procurement. So you really need to understand procurement and conflict of interest policies. Okay, as I said, OSIN shipment of goods, this would be, if it's applicable, uh, it's quite important that you understand uh, the prior approvals. And um, well, with this, there's all kinds of procurement rules with, with uh, a certain percentage of the goods must go on US carriers and so forth, which are not gonna be the cheapest whatsoever. You know, your Panamanian, your, uh, your uh, Filipino, uh, a lot of these ships that are registered in other countries are much cheaper than U.S. goods. This is basically protecting the U.S. maritime industry, okay, making sure they get a fair share, if you will, of the shipments. Okay, so just be careful. Okay, some other things, and I'm just going to go on. So there's other items in the uh, ECFR. All of you, let me just ask this. Please put your hand up if you are not a foreign-based NGO. Are any of you guys U.S.-based? Okay, just please put your hand up. You could be the FHIs of the world or intra health or whatever else. Care, save the children, world vision. Okay, we've got a few. Okay, remember what we're, do what, what we're talking about here is the, the light version. And now there's of course the US version, which may be different. But I think for all of us, if we do follow the, the full version of the, of, the, uh, of the procurement guidelines, you will be compliant with the light version as well. Okay, a few other points here. Uh, we're now into the cost principles. Uh, we talked about reasonable, allocable, allowable. Okay, so uh, let's move some things around here. So these are the, when we do our normal training and the next one coming up, we'll go into a greater detail next, what is that, next Tuesday, Tuesday or Wednesday, next Tuesday on the 5th. Uh, and please come back and we'll talk more about this reasonable, allocable, allowable. But those, I, so I talked about those four things that cost must be. Had to be reasonable, 404. We talked about the prudent person rule, okay? Okay, reasonable, allocable is 405. That's hugely important. What can you charge to the U.S. government? And then, of course, allowability. Many things just aren't allowable based on the cost principles or the source or origin of where you get those from. Okay, so I've, I've mentioned before, go to 22 CFR 228 and get the extra guidance that's available there. Okay, now this 407 is very key. This is where we have prior written approvals from the agreement officer, okay? And this is what it is currently. These items are the current prior approvals that you need. I'm not gonna go through these all, but as I said, there's 26 of these, okay? So if you're right now, until the guidelines change, probably in the next two months, all of these require specific prior approval. And this, this is the same thing as that, that standard provision number one that I read to you. And it went on to say, I read to you, you asked about the Bob Strauss rule, right? About the four corners concept. That was at, four, that was at M1A. M1B is effectively what this says. It says, if you're not sure about the reasonableness or allocability of an item, you can basically get, com get, get confirmation from your AO. Okay, here it talks about the cognizant agency, but that's, that's basically your overhead. Uh, if you're a U.S.-based organization, that's who gives you your night. But since most of you don't have a NICRA or an overhead rate, you go to your AO. Okay. Now, the time to do this, as I said, is when you do your proposal. So you should, when you're doing your proposal, you go through this list. Okay. And then so all these red ones are the ones that are coming out. But the whole point is you would go through your list of all these and saying, are we going to be, are we going to be applying for any of these items? And a lot of these you are going to be applying for. Compensation, salaries, entertainment, all the equipment. Of course, you're going to be applying for this. You need to understand what part of this rule says you need prior approval. And then you specifically put into your proposal, dear future AO, we hope, right? These items we have proposed for, and we're just highlighting to you that we realize as per 407, these need prior approval. Okay, we please receive, if we win, uh, we're, we're uh, you know, we're documenting that we've asked at this stage. And that's why, that's why I'm saying under the new rule, I think if you do that, 
then effectively that means they've received prior approval. This is going to put a ton of new responsibility on the mission side. Okay, a lot of missions don't do incredibly deep due diligence on the proposals, on the cost reasonableness and all this kind of stuff. They just don't. Some people do. Harare does. Uganda does. Uh, I've, I, but some missions we work with don't. Don't do that deep, deep, deep review of the proposals. I think all of them are going to have to start doing that now. Okay, but the bottom line is that I've said, so these I've, I've, I'm highlighting here in, in red, some of these, which to me are quite important, are no longer going to need prior approval. So it screams risk. That to me doesn't mean you can't continue to approve, to ask for approval. Uh, but, uh, and again, you might want to do it for the next year or two until your auditors get religion and, and learn the rules. So they're not hammering you by trying to apply the old rules to you. Okay. So again, just read your award and I'm sure you'll be fine. Okay. We do have a couple more questions. I'm going to just see what we got here. Yeah. Okay. So let's address the questions. Melissa, thank you. I've got some time. Sure. You might be on mute. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. Um, he, there's a question here again about approval um, uh, related to the conflict of interest. If you have a policy specifically about conflict of interest, do you still need to advise your AO about that comp the conflict of interest that, that you're dealing with with this particular procurement? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. You're, I mean, your policy in theory, your policy would say that. So go to that provision. I think it's M. Oh, let me just see now. Uh, I'll go get you the exact number. But yeah, go there. It's 26 or something. Go there. Yeah, M28, conflict of interest. Uh, and start looking importantly about C, D, and E, conflict of interest. M28. And it says you have to have a policy. You have to explain it to your people. And then you must go on. Let me just read it to you. Hang on. I've got it here. Got a little bit of a time. Yeah, this one's serious. M28. So conflict of interest. So it gets down to, um, so at D, it says the recipient must have a system or systems in place to identify, address, resolve, and disclose to USAID any conflicts of interest as described in this provision, which is pretty much everything. Okay. So you got to have a system to identify, as we said. So great. You know, the guy has a wife who works at the IT company. So that's a conflict of interest. How are we going to address it? Okay, well, we've got a committee that looks at how to deal with conflicts, okay? How are we going to resolve? It? Well, he or she is not going to be involved in the procurement. We're going to let someone else make the decisions. And now we have to disclose that to USA. Then it goes on at E to say, the recipient must disclose any conflict of interest and the recipient's approach to resolving the conflict of interest to the agreement officer for the award within 10 calendar days of the discovery of the conflict of interest. Okay. Now that's a problem because, you know, the timing is going to kill it. Then it, then it says F is where I said, it says upon notice from the recipient of this con of this potential conflict of interest and the approach for resolving it, the agreement officer will make a determination regarding the effectiveness of the recipient's actions to resolve the conflict within 30 days of the recipient receipt of the notice, unless the AO advises the recipient they need more time. Right now, again, you waiting around 30 days is, is incredible. And then it goes on to say one more thing at G, the recipient cannot request payment from USAID for costs for transactions subject to the conflict of interest pending notification of USAID's determination. Failure to disclose a conflict of interest may result in cost disallowances, okay? So that one has teeth. Okay, so M28, just, you know, read that one in detail. And, and you know, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think that's one it's going to be tough to implement. That's why it's okay. So now it being as an, an, an auditor and an advisor, I would say you need to make sure that all you IPs, you've got a conflict of interest policy, especially for your procurement guys, that they understand the risks that they're placing your organization under if they don't comply with this stuff. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Next question, please. Yeah, there's a question here again about conflict of interest. Is there a standard of the, for the frequency in declaring contract of interest? I think you just read it, but um, specifically when you need to declare, I think you said within 10 days. Okay, well, that yeah, that okay, that that's more of what you have to tell USA. But in terms of 
individuals, I would say, would say there, there's a lot of things that I would make employees do if I was my NGO. Okay. And it's not just this conflict of interest. It's a lot of things. It is child safeguarding. It is the one about, you know, not using sex workers and stuff like that. There's probably four or five different, uh, different, uh, it's also one on fraud. Okay. On there's, so there's probably five or six. And I would say uh, every time you're going to, you, well, whenever you hire someone before they read all this stuff and they realize that when they, by joining your organization, they are bound by these rules. Okay. And then I would say every time you're re renewing their contract every year, that's when I would say, great, I document, I've reread, I'm aware that this rule exists. Hopefully they'll reread it and they'll sign that, great, I'm not going to hire sex workers. I'm not going to abuse kids. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to discriminate. I'm aware of all these. Okay. And they sign off every year. That to me would be adequate. There's no written rule on that, but that was my advice and no one's ever gone wrong uh, taking that advice. Okay. Just be careful that you do uh, the conflict of interest, uh, you know, at the, at the very beginning when you hire the guy. So for your board members, they should be signing a conflict of interest every board meeting. Okay. I was on the American Chamber here for 16 years, past president, uh, now life member. And every board meeting, we would go in, all the, all the board members would sign a conflict of interest saying, we're not bringing conflicts into this meeting. And after the meeting, you sign saying, we're not taking conflicts out of this meeting. And you keep those on file. Okay, so for your guys, for your board members, who probably should be meeting four times a year under good governance, they should be signing the same thing. They should have conflict of interest policies for all the directors and officers saying the same thing every board meeting, that they didn't discuss anything with a conflict, or they recuse themselves. They left the room when we talked about items that would have a conflict. Okay, good question. Next question. Yeah, the... Continuing on conflict of interest, it says, um, what if the person that has the con conflict of interest, so to go back to the computer example, if that's the only computer provider, that, that wouldn't be the case, I don't think, for computers, but um, if that's the only specialist for that purchase being made, so if that's the only vendor you have, what do you do in that case? Um, well, if it's the only vendor, then you you notify USAID. I, believe, I mean... I'm, I'm trying to say what I would do to be safe, okay? And if there's only one guy, or a you know, vendor, if you will, guy, that'd be a guy. The guy's not male or female, guy is everyone. Um, then you document that. But, you know, chances are you've already used this person or this service before. You know, let, let's, talk, let's talk about like the backbone for technology. It may have to be Huawei or some service provider. You know, there's only one service provider in the country, in many countries. Well, you've got to use those. Now, that's not going to be news to USAID because every other vendor probably uses the same service provider. So if I if there's only one, I would reach out to USAID and say, dear USAID, here's a situation. We need to buy X. To the best of our knowledge, Y is the only service provider. So unless you inform us otherwise, we will be, you know, uh, we're seeking your approval to, uh, to use this vendor. Okay, document that. And then even if you don't hear back from them, Keep that on file to show your auditors that you tried to get approval from USAID for that, what I would call a sole source procurement. Okay. Next question. I have a question here about um, new rules or procedures that um, USAID implements. Are those applied retroactively or only to future, um, in this case, procurements or um, other policies? Yeah. Okay. Good. They're not going to be retroactive for sure. Okay. Now the only, the, the real question is, are they going to be applied from the date of this rule change? Or is it only is, and again, the uniform guidance is going to come out. You're going to get a notice. Well, you're not, but the federal register, the U S government newspaper comes out daily. Uh, and it's going to say this is effective as of, let's just say April 10th. Okay. Now the question is, is there agency? Is USA going to say, Okay, now here's the challenge. The cost principles are the 400 section. And I don't know how USAID can, you know, I don't know how they could sort of delay the implementation of those. What they may delay is the implementation of the, of the, of the, the, the overseas rules, right? The standard provisions. And they may say, or well, they don't have to say anything. Your old, remember your current award has this version, let's say. Okay, so the whole point is this is still part of your award. 
Now, until USA chooses to update this document, that's what the team, Dorothea, Francisco are doing in Washington, until they update this, then your award, your old rules still apply. But that's not necessarily true for the cost principles. Remember, your award says this applies and the cost principle. So that's going to be the big question. And I don't have the answer. That is the question of the day, though. Because in theory, if that, if that de minimis goes up to 15, everyone's going to be saying, where's my money? Okay, and I've talked to many missions, and sorry, guys, there's no extra money. You may have to wait to the next year anyways to uh, to get, if it goes to 15, uh, to, to get the extra money. Because emissions aren't sitting with money just waiting to give you more. Okay, so that's going to start. But what you should be doing, IPs, is be aware of these rules coming up and start planning for your budgeting. Okay, and your controls, your risk management, you know, these all this looseness that I'm talking about. The risk, especially for primes with subs, the looseness of what's going to be allowed, the money to flow, the higher levels, the uh, higher thresholds. Okay, I know I've wandered a bit, but uh, yeah, the bottom line is uh, it's definitely not going to be retroactive. Good question. Next question. And we have a clarifying question about the um, sole solicitor contract of interest, conflict of interest question. Um, what okay. happens if it's the opposite? What happens if your internal IT specialist, for example, is the only person within your organization who has the expertise to evaluate bids, but he or she has a conflict of interest? Well, then I think you outsource it. I mean, you, you know, he or she's probably not the only guy in town or in the world or, you know, whatever in the country that has that knowledge. Uh, so I would outsource it. <clears throat> I would declare it. And again, that's going to take extra money. Well, you highlight that to USAID. We're following your rules. Uh, we're going to have to hire someone to perform this service. Uh, so uh, we're going to outsource it and just please, please approve. And I would I would rather outsource it than you know risk the wrath of USA that you didn't do something, or ask for you know don't ask for forgiveness, ask for approval that you could use your guy and talk about how you are going to mitigate the risk of that, you know that he or she well, I don't know how you're going to do it, but again if you can show USA that you consider you he or she knew the policy, you're highlighting it to them and here's how you've addressed it, uh, that that resolution is what USA really cares about. Okay, next question. Um, this question is going back to the um, debarment slash terrorism checks for vendors. Um, how often do you run a new check for new vendors and for perhaps vendors you're you're using again? Um, well, let's just say the important thing is doing it before you hire them or use them. That's the most important. And then there is no specific rule for how often. That's why I say for all these things, I would do it before the audit or my next fiscal year. Okay, so if you maybe, you know, maybe you, again, maybe you get your, you get your award on uh, October 1st, you know, the beginning of the U.S. government fiscal year. And great, now you're going to hire people. So you run the checks for all your vendors and people then. And then maybe every September, every year thereafter. Okay. There are some organizations who it's sort of interesting that some organizations as a service uh, allow you to you tell them who your employees and vendors are, and then they'll monitor the lists for you. So it's like a reverse check, if you will. You 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 pay for this. And I'm not sure U.S. government would deem that's reasonable to pay for a service provider when you can do it yourself. But you could ask for that. OK, but they would monitor these lists for you. So you say, guys, here's my employees. Here's my employee list. Here's all my vendors. Right, you let us know if and when they show up on this list. Yeah, that's a possibility. Some people do that, but most people uh, do it themselves. Next question, thank you. This participant um, is mentioning that their organization uses a central searching system that runs all three of the checks and additional yeah. ones that are not included. Is that acceptable or do you have to prove and document that you checked each site individually? No, well, that, I think, yeah, that's what I was just mentioning. I'm not sure, I mean, you, you say it's got a name, but um, if that's what they do and you can confirm, you know, they confirm that um, that they do, they include SAM, OFAC, and UN, then that would be adequate. I would just get approval from USAID. Uh, but again, you're, pro you're possibly not the only one doing, uh, using those guys, okay? So if you're, if you're ever in doubt, ask your AO. Next question. 
The next question is about document storage and retention. Does USAID have a policy that um, specifies um, document storage and archive kind of principles? Do they allow both prime and sub awards to kind of retain their documents independently or do they have to retain them together? No, good question. I, I think it's independently. I mean, why would um, a prime take responsibility for a sub's records? Why would a sub give the prime uh, their records? So I think each organization would keep it for themselves. And remember, you've got to follow the rules of your country as well. Those are probably the more important ones because they tend to be more strict or longer. So no, I would expect to find uh, prime and sub records differently. Now, as an auditor, let me just say this, right, guys? This is a very touchy subject, but it's a requirement for all primes to have access to your sub's records, okay? That's 332 uh a5 okay and there and be careful that you have access to the records and especially as the audit threshold moves from 750 to a, a, a million right if i'm auditing you as a prime I'm, i i need access to your subs records why to make sure that you the prime did your due diligence did your oversight did your review of all the subs documents so I'd love to trust you, but I won't, okay? It's called trust, truth, trust, but verify. And so I'm gonna say, great, you're a prime. I wanna see the subs. I wanna see a couple of timesheets. I wanna see a couple of procurement things. I'm not auditing the sub. What I'm auditing is you, the prime, did the right thing by reviewing all these subs documents. So I have to have access. Now that sometimes becomes a problem when some of you said, right? You've got the USAID's putting the big guys under you. And the, like the big U.S. guys are very hesitant to release their records to a subrecipient, foreign subrecipient. But all of you, you have to have access to the sub's records, which means also from a from a uh, from a retention point of view. Now, normally, when we do when we're done with an audit, we're done. Meaning, uh, we do it every year. We do an audit. Assume you don't get hammered by the inspector general, or there's some massive fraud later on. We're probably not going to ask you to go back to year two, three, four, five records. Okay, but in theory, you should have access to those. So please put that in your sub award uh, contracts or your sub awards. Thank you. Next question. I, I did take one more because I, I think we only have about like 15 minutes and I do want to get through some examples, but maybe just do one more for now and then I'll I'll do the rest of them at the end. Sure. Yeah. Okay. The last is about, again, back to the um, doing those checks on SAM and UN. Um, do when you're selecting a, a vendor or a um, service provider, do you um, need to check only for that organization? So that organization name, or do you have to also vet key staff that um, like would be providing a service for you? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. That's called partner vetting, and it's not happening in every country. Uh, we worked for five years in Afghanistan. Well, we audited for five years in Afghanistan, and it's required there. I think it was required in Palestine, uh, in, in the West Bank, and, and other places. So there, where there is concern for, and again, logically, you'd think with going along with terrorism in some of these places, but their partner vetting does require that. There's very specific rules on that about not just the organization, but all the directors and things like that. So yes, that is a requirement only in certain countries. Okay, it's not everyone. Okay, so just generally is XYZ organization on the list or is this name of this employee, well, for, for you, uh, if you're gonna hire a person, is their name on the list? Okay, not their parents or whatever. Okay, great, let's hold off on the rest of them. I'm just gonna try to get through a few more, uh, a few more, Things. So I'll give you an example of a, a, a good or proper procurement transaction. So here we're assuming that this organization, this NGO is going to, ABC organization is going to buy six Bakis or pickup trucks uh, and for the USA project. And each one's going to cost, uh, what is it, $35,000, I think. Yeah, $35,000. So we're going to buy six times 35 is 210. Okay, so we're going to talk about the policies here, the procurement requirements. Okay, we're going to need prior approval for vehicles, remember? And then you got to make sure for the reasonableness point of view that they have programmatic purpose. Okay, so it's not just that, that yeah, vehicles are allowable, but are they needed for your project? So think about it. Do you need four-wheel drive vehicles? 
do you need a four wheel drive pickup truck or can a two wheel drive do it? You know, so that's, there's, there's, you know, again, it's, not, it's complicated, but you do need to make sure you're following all the sort of, all, all the rules that are out there. Okay, so is it justified? You need one with high clearance or extra strong tires or things like that and so forth. So we have many times people want, of course, Toyota Corollas, what do they want? They want Land Cruisers and they'll justify it by the fact that Ford or GM or someone doesn't have a dealer network where when you're out in the rural areas, you can get it just, you can get it, uh, you can get it uh, serviced. And so, you know, generally your Toyotas or your, you know, some of your, your, your Japanese suppliers, your Nissans uh, have an extensive dealer network to get it fixed and a repair for parts. Okay, so that's how we may have to justify how we are going to buy this vehicle. Okay, so we're gonna look at quickly at what a purchase request is, uh, asking for quotations, how do we receive? What do we do when we receive the quotations? Uh, evaluating them and the purchase order itself, and then making sure we verify that we get the goods. Okay. So procurement, as I said, you need some some people in your organization who understand these rules, and they generally tend to be the longer standing people. You know, a lot of times, your large NGOs, these people don't turn over. They are the procurement guys. Okay. And you may have one guy on the project who works with them, but not necessarily. You know, normally your PO people, your your purchasing people are 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 you know in the furniture of the company. Okay, so you make it clear uh, purchase request. It needs to be signed off, preferably. You know why do we need? Okay, high ground clearance is what we need. Our criteria. Okay, and so basically, who's asking for it? Who's who in the NGO? Sorry, yeah, who in the project says is responsible for saying we need a uh, these vehicles? Okay, and I'd be asking, okay, as an auditor now, well, was that in your original budget? Okay. Did you did you seek prior approval from USAID and all these sort of rules that we have here? So I want to see sign offs of smart people. I say smart people, knowledgeable people in the NGO that the right people are asking us to buy a these six vehicles. Okay, do we have budget approval? Is it in the budget? Okay, is is are those funds available? Have they been obligated by USAID? Remember, just because it's in the budget doesn't mean it's available. Your agreement officer has to obligate those funds, meaning release them to you or make them available. So that would be happening at this purchase requisition stage. So the, your procurement guy is going to say, yeah, we can buy it, but first let's make sure it's going to work for our organization. Okay, then they put out their RFQ, request for quotation, and they say tick six times X pickups, and here's what we're going to evaluate you against. Price, high ground clearance, capacity, what, 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 okay? Okay, and then they make it very clear where, you know, if you need questions, send them to us or if you're going to have a Q&A process, but basically they're going to have a deadline and tell you who to send it to. Okay, and then they're going to receive the quotes and our internal controls kick in place. You have to decide, you know, again, is it a physical or is it an email? Is it email acceptable? And then like, just like the whole USAID headache of, is it limited to five gigs or 10 pages or whatever else? to make sure that uh, this, this quotation is correct, okay? So our, our, our procurement guys will say, great, uh, emails are allowed up until 5 p.m. on close of business X date. Or uh, you must put it in our, our, our procurement box, tender box on X floor uh, by this date, okay? And then you have to do the evaluation. So again, we said what the criteria was and therefore we're going to evaluate against it. And it's very important. We were working with an organization one time and they, unfortunately, uh, they had they had done the procurement, but they didn't have uh, necessarily, they didn't at the time uh, document how they picked their choice. And so what happened was uh, USAID rejected that saying, well, you didn't document or the auditors rejected it saying you didn't document how you selected that vendor. Now it was crystal clear to us when we were trying to, uh, trying to help them appeal this loss of $55,000 that basically uh, they, they had selected the absolute perfect vendor, but they didn't document it. And so USAID rejected it, okay? Absolutely, I mean, the auditors rejected it, but unfortunately USAID sustained it. So, uh, so this is critical, document. Have the right criteria, document uh, how you made your selection, okay? Now address, you know, also make sure who's on your evaluation committee, and, and that sort of stuff. And again, what's your policy on that? What's an adequate committee? So this is why it's important when you're setting your threshold, your micro purchase threshold, your, your other thresholds that you document, you know, who's gonna be involved in this process and make sure you have adequate 
policies and adequate staff. Okay, now when you win, it's just generally good, good fair to notify people uh, that they were unsuccessful. I mean, there's times we, we, we propose for audits and we don't hear for three, four months, you know, that we were we successful. Well, certainly if we were successful, you generally hear, but if you're not successful, you're sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. Well, guys, if you, again, not just for audits, but for anything, when someone's been successful, great, they're done, notify them, but notify the losers as well. And they may want to know now about uh, why we lost. You know, frequently if we lose a proposal, why? Did you not like the CVs? Was their price too high? You know, whatever reason, didn't like or or, or whatever. Uh, so let us know so we can be better next time. That's not a requirement, but it's just common courtesy to let people know what how you failed, okay? Under contracting, it's actually a requirement, but under, under assistance, what we call it, there's acquisition, which is contracting, assistance, which is what uh, cooperative agreements are, it's not a requirement, but just assume it's it's good business to let people know. Okay, then you create the purchase order where you are going to explain exactly what we're buying, what we're ordering from you, any delivery address, any information, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and again, who is authorizing this procurement? And I would like to make sure again that the maybe the budget people have been maybe just confirmed it's still available because it could have taken a long time to, uh, to get this uh, a significant order in. Maybe that budget's been used by someone else. Remember, USAID obligates chunks of funding, not necessarily uh, specifically for six vehicles. So I'm just going to say, great, your next $250,000 is obligated. Okay, but IPs never spend more than your obligation. Okay, there's four stories on that where well-intended NGOs who have their own money spend more than's obligated. But then unfortunately, the agreement officer at a later point says, I didn't obligate that money. I'm not going to reimburse you. Okay. I've had clients lose more than a million dollars. I don't have time to tell the stories, but trust me, I've seen people lose a million dollars because they spent their own money doing the right thing. And later on, the agreement officer said, no, you needed my approval. Really sad. Okay, so you put in a purchase order, make it very clear. And notice we're always seeing these PO numbers have numbers. They should be generally be predated. They should be, these requisition numbers should be pre-stamped. And so there's going to be multiple copies, the, the original copy, and there'll be a carbon copy or two behind it, a, yink, a yellow one or a pink one or some other color there you know, to keep track of all these things in different places. Okay, procurement's a process, quite a process. So again, the same thing, the purchase order should have a specific number. And then when in case of the order comes, and then the goods come. That's what we talked about, a goods received note, a GRN it's called. It doesn't have to be called a GRN, but what documentation do we have that we make sure that when it comes in the door, it's what we order. Okay, we had an organization that one time ordered 100 canvas tents. They do a lot of work out in the fields and, and they ordered canvas tents. Well, what do they get? They got plastic tents. The guy receiving it didn't know. He counted, we got 100. I guess we ordered 100 tents. Calls up, did, we, did you order 100 tents? Yes, okay, but they didn't get what he wanted. They didn't get what they bought. They bought canvas. They, they Unfortunately, they got plastic, which of course we know across Africa is pretty hot. So, okay, so just make sure that the receiving department uh, signs off and is in a, in, a, in a position, if you will, to understand what they were buying. Okay, then we get to put it in the fixed asset register. Okay, make sure the, uh, let's just make sure, let's just go here. Okay, we're not gonna have a lot of time to talk about property. Okay, but you would have a fixed asset register that has everything about that organization. Uh, uh, Melissa, can you stay on for a little while longer? I think in theory, your time's up, but I'd like to go through a little bit about title. You're on mute, maybe? We're good to stay, we're good to stay late, yeah. Okay, great. I'm gonna go on a little bit longer here. But let's just say the fixed asset register is very much part, everyone, of your procurement process. They need to work hand in hand. The asset people have to be able to document what they bought, you know, from where, who, uh, um, uh, you know, the date it was purchased and so forth. And that is all described in USAID's documentation. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the property. Okay, property needs to be vested somewhere. Now, just because USAID paid for it and you bought it doesn't mean you own it. You don't own it, okay? At the beginning here, you have title to it. And that title, you need title to insure it, to buy the licenses, to pay the fines and all that stuff, right? You need title to it. Yeah, but that doesn't mean you own it. You don't. USAID will tell you in your said Schedule A that I set up front, you know, who's going to get this thing titled to. Now, normally it goes to you, the recipient, but it could go to the U.S. government itself. 
or it could go to the eventual users who's mainly the beneficiaries of the project. So maybe it's a hospital project and you're supporting, you know, the, the provincial ministry of health. So they could either give title to you, the NGO, or the U.S. government keeps it themselves, or they say uh, invest, the title vests with the Ministry of Health of X province. Okay, and that would enable whichever the title holder is to do the procurement, or sorry, do the licensing and the insurance and all that kind of stuff, pay the fines and so forth. Okay, so we, again, talking about property is quite important. These are the terms that the U.S. government uh, wants you to make sure you understand. So this, this $5,000 may be going up to $10,000 for property. So that's a huge, huge change for us. Most of us keep track of our assets at the $500 or $1,000 level. Okay, remember, they're doing this. This is a global change rule, and it's doing this to make life easier in the U.S. But it's just to, overseas here, it's not going to be easier. It's going to be riskier. Okay? I wouldn't recommend anyone increase your equipment uh, level to $10,000 when it goes to there, okay? Keep it lower. The lower means better control, okay? That's, uh, let's just keep going here. Uh, let's say property, what do we have here? Okay, there's a certain, there is a there is a, a hierarchy of use for property. So the first hierarchy is the program that bought it. Okay, so say you have three USA projects and one CDC project. So you buy it for project A, USA project A. Well, Project A has first rights to use it, okay? USAID Projects B and C have second rights, okay? Only if the USAID Project doesn't want to use it, then can another agency, uh, a CDC project, possibly use it, okay? So you got to be careful of that, and the auditors will be looking for that, okay? Um, let's just see here. Okay. That's what we said. Okay, we've already talked about this. Okay, use uh maintenance please 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 maintain your property let's just see here let's just go here Where are we going here okay now let's just go down here we're still in title making sure we are okay title property use we've talked about maintenance you must maintain your properties okay so all i'm saying is we auditors are going to check it but why wouldn't you i mean it's a requirement anyways but Generally, at the end of the five years, you're going to get to keep the property. So why wouldn't you want it in perfect working order? I'd highly suggest that. And this tells us now what the fixed asset register is going to require. So all I'm saying is the serial number or you know, the, the item description of what you bought and so forth. Okay, this is quite clear. You need to do a physical inventory at least every two years, but normal accounting practices would be every year. Okay, you must maintain insurance. Uh, if you maintain your own property, you also must maintain your own. Okay, let's just take a two minute break here. Okay, just get your coffee loaded up. Let's take a two minute break. I'll be back in two minutes. While we wait for Doug to come back from his two minute break, if you have any questions, please feel free to add those now into the Q&A box um, down below. Um, and Doug can get to your questions at the end of the presentation. Okay, welcome back. Um, we we're talking about title and use of property and then property maintenance and then property insurance. Okay, now this is quite important because uh, this is a must, right? And I've highlighted these things. These are one of the 351 musts that you have. 
And uh, basically, the concept is if you insure your own property, you must insure the U.S. government. So that's the first thing. And then it goes on to say, even if you don't insure your own property, but you can insure the U.S. government property, you must. Okay, so there's zero reason not to insure the U.S. government property. People say, oh, no, but this is so safe and stuff never gets stolen here. Doesn't matter. If it does get stolen, then you're going to be, not personally, but your organization is going to have to replace that with their own money. Okay, so just trust me here. Insurance is something that uh, U.S. government's very generous with insurance. And I highly recommend that your, you know, your property people understand the insurance policies and then, of course, uh, play by them. Okay. When we have any lost image or theft of property, you have to document it and notify the agreement officer. This is a requirement. Okay. And that's, you know, again, they want it for multiple reasons. They want to know about, you know, think about laptops. Okay. Obviously, accidents in vehicles, you know, people frequently find out when it's a when it's a, a an NGO vehicle, then you know the 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 claims are much higher because they think there's deep pockets or they know there's insurance. Okay, but what happens if laptops get stolen? Any loss, damage, or theft must be reported. Okay, laptops these days have some very sensitive information on them. And this course is not really about the protecting your, your, your information, but that's critical that you make sure you have adequate safeguards to protect the data on your laptops. Because if one gets stolen, it's not the value of the laptop that we're worried about. It's the value of the data on the laptop. I mean, many, you know, HIV AIDS is still a, a, a uh, it's still a, uh, unfortunately, you know, a, uh, a negative in many countries. Uh, many of the projects we're working on democracy and governance, you know, information on that computer would be very sensitive. Uh, in many parts of the world, you have, you know, other rights, uh, gay, lesbian, other rights organizations, societies that you may, people may be working with, huge risk if that data got out. So just please, please, please protect. When we talk about security. We say protect your people, protect your assets, protect your data. Okay, but getting back here. So if a laptop is stolen or is a, a, a car is damaged, you must report it to the agreement officer. Okay, now what happens at the end of the project? Okay, there's, and these rules changed reasonably recently. Okay, now... We talked about closeout. So I said six months before our example, June 30, you want to be preparing for your closeout. And that's the time to start identifying for your AO and you prepare your property disposition plan. Okay, and it's going to be a report to the agreement officer of all the stuff that now, this has changed now, all equipment that has a current fair market value of $5,000 or more. Okay, it used to be anything we bought that was $5,000 or more. Now it's current fair market. So at the end of the project, what are you still going to have that's worth $5,000? That's what you want to put on this sheet. Okay. And ask for, uh, you know, generally you would normally, I assume you'd ask for it to get to keep it. Okay. Then on that list has to also go new or unused supplies with an aggregate fair market value of 5000 So be very careful there. You know, a lot of times people have this use it or lose it mentality. Well, that is unfortunately, you know, if you use it, but you didn't need it for the project, then you may have to pay that back. Okay. Even if you have a follow on project, and I've seen this where people say, oh, no, but, you know, we're, we're finishing up on September 30, but we're starting a new project on, you know, the next, the next, uh, the next, uh, on October 1st. Okay. Well, that's a new project that's got its own budget. So you can't use the first budgets. Uh, first project's budget for the project uh, follow-on budget uh, activities. Okay, so just be careful there. And auditors will test that. What they'll do is they'll look in your final couple months of a project and look at your expenditures and see whether anything looks funny or, or out of uh, out of the norm, if you will. Okay, be very careful. This course, we don't have a lot of time to talk about this, but regularly now when working with missions, I hear people talk about the different color of money or one-year money. Now, this is something that we auditors would never know because it's never in the award, okay? But IPs, you need to make sure you know when you're talking to your AO or whoever at USAID, is this money restricted to one year? And a lot of the PEPFAR money and the COVID money was what we would call one-year money, okay? So you need to be careful. If you're going to spend that, if you're going to receive that kind of money, you need to make sure you, you do spend it or lose it. And I had, I was, I won't say which mission, but I was at a mission. We were talking about this. And the mission controller said, but Doug, 
hang on, use it or lose it. He said, isn't that actually the official definition of waste, right? That's a new definition that's just come out in well, the, the, the current yellow book, waste, which is, of course, spending money you didn't need to spend. And he's correct, right? You say, geez, I'm going to use it or lose it. Well, that using it or losing it is effectively waste, which is a, 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 a problem. So certainly know when you've got your one-year money and try to spend it, of course, spend it you know, appropriately. But at the end of the day, if you have leftover money that you don't really have a purpose for, be careful about just spending it uh, for the sake of spending. Okay. Um, yeah, your agreement. So notify your AO early on on your property disposition plan because I can promise you your your old stuff is not high on their list of, of uh, interests, okay? So you definitely would like to have uh, uh, have it approved in advance so you can know, am I gonna need to keep it or might I have to sell it and pay the money back? Okay, just a few more slides. Um, what do we have here? The title use of property, disposal may include, retaining, okay. You might get to keep it and USA and US, or CDC says you're done, you get to keep it. Uh, they might say, pay us the money back. Okay, uh, and then that is um, that is uh, well, you get to keep it, or you may get to sell it. Okay, but more often than not, they don't do this, or they may say transfer it to another project. So you've had a project for five years, and then there's a follow-on project, but they say no, sorry, you didn't win, but please transfer your assets to that new project. Okay, and there'd be rules around that. Okay, what else do we have here? Um, yeah, we've talked about test. Investing. Uh, I talked about maintenance. We talked about insurance. Again, annual inventory, we'd recommend. I mean, they say every two years, but certainly um, uh, you would be, you would be, uh, your auditors will do an annual inventory anyways. Okay. And of course, remember, some of these things needed specific prior approval as we talked about. Okay. So a fixed asset register. So this is an organization that basically what the Hilux is, and they say this is a register. Well, that's not adequate. Okay, it's not just we bought vehicles. Six, we would need, this is the level of information you need in a proper. Each item is, is its own line item, the date you bought it, of course, where it's being used and so forth. Okay, so you, that's why I'm saying you need, a, you need a, a team of people who understand procurement and asset management. Okay. I go on with that. Uh, I'm just going to leave it. That was just an example we're going to use for you, but we don't we, we don't have a lot of time to talk about an example. Okay, so the bottom line is um, the definition of the asset. Okay, uh, capital. So what, what we're sorry, what we're saying is your policies and procedures need um, uh, the definitions. Okay, of what your assets are, the, the thresholds. I want to see the policy for when I'm going to buy stuff, what my levels are. What are my procedures when we sell stuff? Okay, the asset verification process, how often you're gonna do it and who's gonna do it. Uh, the minimum information required in the fixed asset register, as we said, it's gonna be that. Okay, the insurance guidance, what do we insure? And that, that my, my, my strong recommendation to you is insure everything. And then again, how are we going to main our property uh, and equipment? Okay, guys, I see we have a, new, a few more questions here. So as I said, uh, any questions, certainly you can let us know. I did say we have another training coming up, an open course on March 7th starting, which is the full-blown courses, you know, the 16-hour uh, compliance and financial management, and then an eight-hour of the five most critical, uh, the five most critical things that you need to know, including 10% de minimis, close-out management, subrecipient management, internal controls, and fraud and conflict of interest. Okay, so those would be available. But just yeah, send us an email if you're keen. Uh, and otherwise, keep listening to these baby versions on the uh, wonderful ASAP uh, 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 program. So I want to thank Melissa. I want to thank you for um, for assisting us, and certainly USAID for hosting us, making this possible. Uh, Melissa and the ASAP team have for about three years now, uh, as you saw when she started, uh, conducted probably well over a hundred of these webinars with like about 25,000 or more participants. And I've been quite happy, those of you who have participated in my sessions. And again, there's one coming up next Tuesday. Right, Melissa, I'll turn it over to you to the final Q&A.
Yeah, there's just a couple of remaining questions. So the first is on um, when to do different types of procurement. So whether to do a purchase order versus a longer service contract, when would you do each of those? And um, what are the kind of USAID policies around that? Okay, very good question. So those, when I talked about that bear claw, that's actually what we're talking about. So there are a couple different thresholds. There is the zero to 10,000 now, or zero to whatever you declare your micro purchase threshold is, okay? And there, there are certain, you don't really need much for that micro purchase uh, because that's where you can have sole sourcing. You can, th th there's rules around it though. You can sole source, but then, you, you're expected to round robin it amongst your, your sort of suppliers, okay? So there's rules for zero to 10, and then between 10 and 250,000. Now that's your simplified acquisition threshold. That's where, again, most of our, our, our procurements are going to be probably in that range, assuming where you set your micro purchase threshold. Okay, so there, that's what I described to you. You need multiple vendors, you need to describe what you need, you need to evaluate against that and so forth, okay? Then above that is closed tender and things that would be probably very unlikely for us needing board approvals and things like that. That is where I said that would be that would be in the actual uniform guides guidelines. Okay, and that is at section three hundred and it's well. There's a couple of like three hundred and seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. There's a whole subpart, a whole section on procurement. That's where you'll find it. Two CFR two hundred, starting about three hundred in. 15, 16, up to 320, 21. Okay, very good guidance. Uh, so I'm just saying, any procurement guys, I would read the full version as well as our, our USAID standard provisions. Great question. Thank you. Next question, Melissa. The next question, um, and our last question, unless anyone else has any final questions, is about um, procurement guidelines or policies. Is there um, one specific uh template that should be used or does each organization develop that on their own? Okay, great question. And I think USAID over time has paid or contracted for projects to create these guidelines, okay? Melissa, I might even think that the ASAP, this our fantastic ASAP project that has another of other partners, ASAP is IntraHealth, by the way, right? Accelerated support, a lot of you are on this program to advance developing partners for the purpose of making many organizations prime recipients or subs. Okay, I think they may have a procurement guideline, but there's no official US government guideline. And there's a reason for that. Because I mean, in many times we've, you know, we've done projects for the US government and said, guys, you know, you ask us what you could do better and we suggest you get involved this way. And frequently they say, we can't. And I say, well, why not? And they say, well, we can't get involved and when I say get involved, we can't get involved in these things of, of, of a prior approvals for certain types of policies, and procedures, because uh, because later on, if the auditors find fault, then we are conflicted. Effectively, that's a U.S. government conflict. OK, so I would certainly go online to I, I think the starting point, Melissa, would for them to go to the ASAP website, right, the IntraHealth ASAP website and see what tools we have created for you. Now, I know we were part of the subrecipient management. Uh, subrecipient management module. Okay, that is on the ASAP website. I think another part of the consortium may have done a procurement one. Otherwise, just go to USA.gov, search for procurement guidelines, or reach out to the FHIs and APT associates and you know the other large NGOs uh, over time, over many projects, they may have prepared certain documents. Great question. Okay, anything else? for all of the questions that our participants asked us. So thanks, Doug, for um, answering all of those. Great. Okay. Well, thanks very much, everyone. As I said, uh, uh, you've got our contact details uh, if you're interested in the other courses. But more importantly, is the ASAP uh, the next next Tuesday. There's a follow-on to this. I think it's financial management. And what's the other half of that? Financial management and... Internal it controls is, and compliance. Got the slides here. Yeah, internal controls. That's the green book. You won't be able to see this because it's green and I've got a green screen, but it is the green book and it is uh, the internal control process that the U.S. government expects you to follow. Very important. Um, you know, internal controls are so important. 59% of fraud happens because the, the organization had poor internal controls. 
Okay, so the best thing you can do, everyone, to reduce fraud is to have strong and thorough controls. And we'll sort of cover that in some uh, level of detail in uh, next week. Okay, with that all, thank you very much. We look forward to seeing you again. And again, you've got our contact details. If there's anything we can do for you, God bless and stay safe. Thanks, Melissa, to you and the team. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Again, today's presentation slides, as well as a recording of today's presentation, will be available at the ASAP Resources webpage. That link was sent in the chat several times um, for you to download. Additionally, there are many other resources on that page, um, as Doug mentioned. So feel free to take a look um, at the other resources available to you. Um, you can use those and share those with colleagues as you find appropriate. So um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and especially for USAID for continuing to fund these, and for Doug for, for an excellent presentation. Thanks, Melissa. Just one more point. Okay, as I said at the beginning, right, the, this, these, these, this presentation is valid until the changes come. So, I mean, you know, if you, you know, this is, this, I can promise you uh, this presentation won't be 100% valid, you know, three months from now, just because of all those highly, highly, highly likely changes. Okay. So, uh, you know, use it for the next month or two, but just keep an eye out for those changes and then, you know, have your team jump into the, uh, jump into the guidance and, uh, and absorb it and then be ready for, you know, USA to modify your award. I just had to throw that in there, Melissa, because this isn't, you know, this, this, these slides aren't good forever. Okay. Very true. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers all. Bye. Thanks, Doug. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your days. Bye-bye.